So the million dollar question we're all asking ourselves is whether or not the microphone works this time. I think that's a good way to start. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another Philips auction discussion. Uh, it's, been, it's been a month since we last did this, and there is a reason why we are looking at the Hong Kong auction in contrast to the Geneva auction, which we will get to. Say hi to everyone in the chat. I see Curtis, Raymond, Peter C, Chaz, Yellow Raincoat, welcome, Dr. Bob. Megan is currently in Hong Kong, and she's waking up. It's like five in the morning, so get another half an hour sleep, Megan, really. Uh, uh, blue shirt, Curtis, Thomas, welcome, guys. Oh, it's so good to have you here. Philip Luftwaffel, oh, it's good. Welcome. Great to have you. We're going to get started. Uh, first thing, a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the theme. It's a good thing to actually uh, comment one if you can hear me. It's a good way to always start. Is the sound clear? compared to last time, which it was like it was like 10 minutes of me faffing around trying to get the headset synced up. Is it now clear? Can you hear me okay, ladies and gentlemen? Uh, beyond that, okay, good, Blue Shirt, thank you. Thank you, everyone, awesome, that's good to know. It sounds clear. So before getting into the discussion, one thing I would like to mention is this week, I uh, put up a video about the watches of the French Armed Forces, and it took it's taken a year to put together. Uh, if you would like to see it, there should be a link in the corner of the screen once the show is finished. But it goes into a very deep discussion around all of these watches and many more. It was quite the, the history lesson for, for everyone around. So it should be good. If you're interested in seeing that, all available for you. Um, again, I'll put the link in the corner of the screen for you to catch up. But let's get to the discussion because it's it's a lot. And compared to previous the previous show that we did, there was something like... 230. This time around, there's 312. Okay. No chance am I covering 312. This time around, we've done something a bit sneaky. I have a cheat sheet of about 100 watches that I think are worth looking at and discussing. Let me hit the water quick. Has anyone else experienced dry mouth when they're talking? Who knows? Okay. More of you in the chat. I see Turbo T2, Sam Ray. Welcome. Philip, I think I said hi. Mr. Cassio, Oak, B. Dev, Scott, welcome. Uh, who else? That's just great. Roar of the Tiger, Kevin, so cool. Thank you, everyone, for joining, being a part of the show. So, yeah, the last time we did this, it was about a month ago, and yeah, it, it was a marathon. I think it ended up being four hours, ten minutes. We're going to try and avoid that. We're going to keep it a bit more minimal this week, maybe about two hours, two and a half at a push, because, again, I wanted this to be more of a highlight reel instead of discussing the stuff we always see. So the cliche things we see most of the time, like the Nautiluses and the modern Rolexes and all of that, we're going to try and skip through some of those and look to the more interesting ones, the outliers. So uh, what else can I, there's something else I wanted to mention. Oh yeah, this, the, the first watch, of course, this being lot 801, uh, they don't, they don't categorize things from one onwards. I think they just continue the, the numbers. So this was good. Time and Tide have just put out a article about $140,000 scam that was almost <laughs> taken up by a 17-year-old who tried to swap out a, a fake one of these with a real one with a with a collector. Very interesting uh, how times are changing and how the interest to these, it's just, anyway. So discussing the difference between Hong Kong and Geneva, let's uh, jump to lot 806. That's the first one I want to focus in. Another thing, look to the description of this video down below. You will see a link to the Philips page, and you should be able to follow along as the, the show progresses. But I'm going to be jumping from a couple. Like there, There's one segment when there are like 30 watches that we're going to miss because a lot of them are, you can call them filler, next to the more interesting things to talk around. Uh, dry mouth only when cocaine. Yeah, Raul, that's, that's it. Huh? Uh, that's, that's definitely a downside. It's so weird. Every time I get into the presenting mode, it's the weirdest thing trying to like get into the theme of just talking about watches. Uh, I see J.W. Wallace, many more of you that I can't. Uh, Clam Walker, welcome. Uh, Lefroy, Koji, welcome all of you. Dan, the Watchman. Yeah, I'm actually surprised we're doing another one of these shows so soon. But the fun thing about it is that, you know, you stay for the the conversation. You come for the watches, you stay for the conversation around them. So by all means, ask some watch questions. You know, the community feedback is always the best part of these shows. Right. I'm going to start with lot 806, being the longer one. Sorry, the longer, what is it now? Chronograph. Oh my goodness, what, where's his head? The platinum flyback datograph. This was the first longer I ever handled in the wild, and it is 
as good as you'd think. It's an amazing, amazing watch. And another thing they don't do here, if you look on the right-hand side, you'll see the description that we always make fun of. Uh, we also have the estimates and the sale price in Hong Kong dollars. They don't give you the sale price in, in dollars or euros or anything. So we might have to do a bit of a currency conversion. I hope the screen's clear enough for you to see. I hope it's pretty legible. Uh, okay, hitting, I'm going to go for the water again. <laughs> uh, Sam Ray says, Christopher Ward is going to send me watches for my photography. Congratulations. I mean, Sam Ray, you, you take photos of cars. Hey, you're, you're an automotive photographer. You're going to do a good job, man. Congratulations. Taking it from the water again. Oh, it's so strange. I was um, out cycling this evening, doing a bit of exercise before the show, and the pollen is out in full force. So oh, I'm probably going to be sneezing in all sorts. This is a really cool watch. Uh, it's pretty gorgeous. 2008. I'm quite surprised. I'm pretty sure one of the originals came out in about 1999. So this one was out for a while before uh, they upgraded it and changed it in a few places. But it is gorgeous. It is really gorgeous. Uh, very, Yeah, Raymond, I agree. It is stunning. Now, the price ended up selling for 500,000 Hong Kong dollars. I don't know what that means. If someone maybe has an, a Google tab open, they could maybe share the, the actual dollar price for these. What's interesting is that today they only did about 50 watches and tomorrow there's, there's going to be like 280 left to go. So I, they had a bit of a problem with their timing. I think they were about half an hour late during the show. Edwin, welcome. I'm going to move on next. Really cool watch. We're going to jump to 808 next. And the cool thing is we can just jump across and it doesn't get in the way of the presentation, which is really nice. This Harry Winston is something pretty special. Sold for an insane amount of money, 3.6 3 Hong Kong dollars. And what the awesome thing about it is that it's a Harry Winston case that's easily recognizable, but it's an FP Jean movement. And we know the love that goes into FP Jean now. And I've actually... I've included a, a few of them in this in this talk, not too many of them. I wanted to specifically look at the more outlier pieces. So the pink dial, I, you can understand why this is an interesting piece. It has a remontoir, it's, it's a tourbillon, it's got a pink explosive dial. It's a piece unique, that's another important thing. Uh, and the way that Harry Winston does his cases, like knuckle duster, I don't know what what is the actual description of the name of these cases. I would love to know because... They are, it's, it's so unique to his style, but the actual, the, the, the styling itself eludes me. It feels like something out of the 30s, feels a bit deco. Okay, jumping into the chat, I see Megan saying that every 10,000 Hong Kong is 1,300 US dollar approximately. Thank you, Megan. That's still quite a lot of maths that we're going to have to do as the show goes. It's, isn't it funny that we have to like, oh, I'm going to struggle. I'm definitely not going to try and do maths while running this. I think the easiest thing would be to just drop that number, 3.6 mil into the, the Google converter and they'll give you a pretty pretty good balance. Yeah, but these lugs, they are not for everyone. They are a love it or hate it thing. This is obviously very true to Harry Winston's aesthetic, but it also gives the watch a certain age to its presentation. And uh, and Samurai says it reminds me of FP Jean. It's pretty much an FP Jean dial. That's why it looks because it, it's an FP Jean movement, FP Jean, FP Jean dial. That's cool, really nice. And Debethun killed it as well. I think I've covered that as well. I can't remember. I'm going to jump to it now, though. So as I just get into the rhythm, bear with me. For the first, like, half an hour, I have to wake up and get the presentation going. It takes takes a bit of time. A good old, uh, let's see, Design Atelier, welcome. I uh, got the good old J Johnny Walker Black Label. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, I have to drink the mild stuff for these shows because they. Uh, my voice goes, as most of you know, my voice disappears eventually. This dial looks like a skull. It does. I mean, that's that's the arrangement. The, the tourbillon on the left-hand side is one of his uh, typical traits. Okay, so we're jumping to 809, offered with no reserve, ended up going for 800 Hong Kong. And another really cool outlier. I think I've seen these advertised on places like Watchbox and you know Instagram and those funky, quirky forums. But it is, I mean, look at the descriptions, a rare, unusual, and eccentric limited edition PVD coat to titanium tourbillon. Now, I mean, this, for the, for the person on the outside, you can look at this and say, is that a swatch? You wouldn't really know what the, what the approach is about. I don't know if this is a piece unique. Oh, they made, they made nine of these pieces. It's a funny thing. It's a real quirky machine. Uh, I wouldn't say it's, it's a watch for everyone. Again, it's very deco, very, uh, I don't know. How would you explain it? 
I really like the the idea of a watch that doesn't take itself seriously. Later on, we're going to be looking at some Genta pieces, like a Mickey Mouse watch and stuff like that. It uh, it evokes the sense of you know younger years when you were a child, when you know life was a bit simpler and you didn't have to worry about too much, and you could be creative at that age. It's almost as if a child came up with the drawing, you know, presented it that way, and that's the final result. Again, it's so peculiar. And you notice, I probably can't zoom in for you to see, but at the bottom left corner, we have a, a blue square, red triangle, and a yellow circle. And that's true to the Bauhaus aesthetic. So I guess that's what they were trying to go for here. <laughs> Sam Ray saying, SpongeBob SquarePants, that's it. That's it. Megan loves this watch, 809. Again, if you can tag me, tag me in the chat, it'll be easy for me to see comments. Um, <laughs> I'll explain it in far less favorable terms. Yeah, I mean, it's not for everyone. It's, it's a real strange one. And the beauty about the Hong Kong, this is actually nice. We've been 10 minutes in. The beauty about the Hong Kong auction next to the Philips uh, Geneva is that there's so much more care and attention put into the less favorable pieces. We're going to see, you know, Enicar and Eberhard and lots of really nice vintage watches that don't get as much attention. I mean, it, it looks like compared to this, Geneva only focuses on the core trio of watches. We're talking Patek Nautilus's Royal Oaks. It's nice to see the, the outliers, and there's lots of them here, which is why it's good to categorize them in a way. Typical Ellen Silberstein, Jewish French architect, watchmaker, very popular in the 90s. Thank you for that, Raymond. I did not know that. Again, that's the beauty about these shows is that you can learn <laughs> all the complexities. Okay, jumping to 810 next. I think what I'm going to have to do, I'm going to have to cross off some of these. I've got a pen and a piece of paper here next to me, so bear with me because last time I did the show, it ended up being four and a half hours long and it nearly put me in hospital. So we're going to try and avoid that. <laughs> okay, cool. This is going to be a bit easier. Wish they provided loom shots. Well, most of these watches don't have loom. I, th I think that last one did. Uh, so anyway, this Roger Dubuis, beautiful, beautiful example. The reason why I wanted to focus on it is the presentation of these pieces. Some of them are stunning. From 1999, it's a single pusher chronograph. I guess the one divisive thing, it's, it's always smiling at you. You know, you don't notice smiling, self-winding on dials most of the time. It's the one thing you recognize from brands like, uh, like Tudor, the originals. But this is just such a beautiful arrangement, and I think it deserves some time in the spotlight. Went for 750K, which is pretty steep. I don't know what that equates to. Probably about $70,000-ish, roughly. Uh, okay, hopping into the chats, which they provide loom shots here. Any car watches are also stunning at the auction. Got to view them yesterday. Oh, there's some good stuff. And I, I have also specified looking at vintage Rolexes and things, which we will enjoy later on. This beautiful-looking watch, though, huh? Uh, sometimes the, you know, that restraint that some of these watches have make all the difference. And we're going to see that across the board. Uh, long jeans did you exact one? Hold on a sec. Great mono pusher. Which long jeans did the exact one recently? I think it was, ooh, I'm going to butcher this, but it, was, it wasn't a Weems model. I'm going to take a hit from the water again. The dry mouth is real today. I know why. I'm on new tablets for, uh, for hay fever. Benadryl. Uh, citrazine dihydrochloride. I think that's the reason. <laughs> it's probably a side effect. I'm getting dry mouth. Uh, Mono pusher looks like a Patek. It does. It does. And of course, we know our man Roger Dubuis. I'm not big with move with movements, as you know. I don't cover movements very much. I should spend a lot more time. I don't know if it's based on a Lamania caliber, but it's beautiful. I mean, everything. The case back has been addressed nicely. Of course, you get the full kit, box and papers, uh, deployant, all of that. It's gorgeous. Okay, going to jump across to lot 811. Well, this is pretty easy. I've noticed there's actually, I thought this is worth discussing, who doesn't love a crash? Um, it's interesting because there, there are sections where we end up seeing five or six watches in a row that are brilliant, and then there's like 20 that are meh. And it seems like that's a common thread. Throughout this auction, you'll see the difference. Like at one stage, I jump from, what is it? A thousand and yes, we're going to go up to a thousand later on. Uh, basically, from a thousand and thirty to a thousand and forty-three, we skip like twelve watches, twenty watches. Okay, now let's get back into the chat. The crash. Speaking of crashes, I wonder if my laptop is going to help us today. Again, if you were here for the last show with the uh, the <laughs> the Geneva auction, you'll understand. What happened the last time? It was just a technology nightmare. Dad had a real crack at the Eterno Kritiki, but it was sought after. Did they do it? I'm going to have, to, I, hopefully I covered that one and I saved it. 
Uh, okay, and Raymond mentioning an Irishman was found on the top of the pub after being told that his drinks were on the house. <laughs> wow, that's a good way to start the show. Jeez, I mean, for a sober brain, I don't know how many of us are going to be laughing at that. But anyway, discussing the crash, there's lots of uh, history. There's lots of conjecture about how this watch began, how it existed, and, and the whole story. Apparently, most of it is, is BS, the idea that it was collected from a car crash and was then remade. Uh, I don't know the full the full reasoning behind it. I th there's there's some belief that um, oh, what's his name? Andy Warhol was involved in the process of making this. It looks like the kind of watch that Salvador Dali would make. And these have risen in popularity. Unfortunately, they've become harder and harder to find because you're seeing them on celebrities now and all of this. It's the latest talking piece. I love this. Look at the case back. That's yeah, cool. It's really cool. And this being. Is it a French? It's a, it's a Paris, the Paris edition. Do they only make this in Paris or do they have a, a crash London? Ooh, let's have a look. Numbered 113 of 400 pieces. Again, I don't read these descriptions very often because normally it's just full of fluff. So uh, the answer for dry mouth is more whiskey. Thank you for the super chat, please. Show. I've got to be careful. Really, the, the whiskey then burns the throat. The water quells it. Fisherman's Friend is on tap. I've got lots of them. Oh, I'm going to have a time. Okay. Hitting the whiskey, why not? Thanks, Blue Shirt. And another thing, watch talk with the punters. We need to, I mean, you guys need to run these shows on Saturdays. Even if I'm doing one of these, I mean, in an ideal world, I'd be running the show in the background. People would be talking on your side. People would be able to switch between the two shows. I think that would be a great way for us to like co-present. Okay, Karen on through. Enabler, Blue Shirt is the true enabler. I agree, fully. It's a beautiful watch. I, I know it's not for everyone. There's some out there. I think designers especially find these to be such grail pieces. Another thing to note is there's this little heart at the bottom of the page, and I can't get rid of it. You notice at the, the bottom left here. Unfortunately, it's their way of wanting you to favorite the watch as you're saving these lots. But uh, when you when you put it into dark mode, it highlights. I don't know why. Yeah, so designers and those and people in those fields really enjoy this just because it is such such a peculiar animal. And it is, it's a lot of fun. I enjoy it. It's definitely not the Cartier we recognize. And speaking of which, there's another one later on that's very cool that I really liked. It's kind of an evolution of the crash. Jumping to lot 818 next, because why not? Right. So again, there were a handful that I avoided. We've jumped about seven lots ahead because these earlier ones, I mean, if I just switch to them, you'll probably see they kind of cliche oh geez not all of them are <laughs> see we've how many of these have we seen that's another thing it's it's the repetition i want to try and avoid the repetition of the modern pieces that we see time and time again this is beautiful though another platinum dual time double escapement we all love a resonance uh, it's this is a really nice colorway too i'm actually quite miffed that i missed it but I wanted to try and keep it down to like a hundred or so watches that we'll be discussing instead of going so far ahead uh, I see Neville joining us. Welcome. And George and many more of you. I see Mark T joining us. Uh, lots of other names. Sorry that I'm missing you in the chat. So so Koji says, my, my friend takes antihistamines because he gets an Asian tan from alcohol. Is that really a thing? <laughs> uh, yeah, antihistamines for me this time of the year. And then, and then I'm pretty sol uh, solid, sorted. Okay, we're going to skip through some of these genres because there are lots of them and we do cover them later on. Why did I focus on this? Uh, I liked the idea that it was a perpetual chronograph. I don't think we see these very often in the Royal Oak category. And don't worry, there aren't many Royal Oaks that are covered during the show. I think a lot of us are tired of seeing them. <laughs> I mean, they're just everywhere and it's it can get a bit exhausting. There's some that are amazing to look at and to take in, but then it does get a bit hectic. So this being a white gold model, repeating perpetual chronograph, it's pretty beautiful for what it is. Do love the presentation. I think the gray dial was what spoke to me the most. And it went for three million. Oh, what is going on? I love these these auction talks. I've said this like a trillion times because we get to see just where the interest lies in this space. This is not exactly a true reflection of the collector market, but it gives you a good idea of what sells and what people are interested in looking at. So the idea is to go in the complete opposite direction and you can find amazing stuff for good deals. And you find here that in the Hong, Hong Kong shows, they do bring in those outliers to test the water. So yeah, 
Very good. Okay, let's move away from this. We're going to jump to 819 next. I don't know what this is. Oh, I mean, here we, here's an example of an outlier. CK2042. This is probably, I didn't have a look at the reference. 1940s. Okay, that makes sense. We've got some sector dial action going on there. We've got an inner bezel that also has the hours on it. I don't know why, but but who cares? It's something else. Of course, it's a pilot watch. It's 41 mils in diameter, which is insane. This one is one of the, the real like star watches for me from the show, I think. It went for 300. I mean, what, I don't know what that is. Add a thousand. So you just divide it by a thousand, basically. You end up getting, what, 30-ish 30, 30 grand. It's so cool. The wide lugs. I mean, I would imagine those lugs are probably 20 mils wide. I mean, that's cool. When you think of the age of this thing and you think of that final result, oh, it looks so nice. This Again, this is what I love about these shows. Sometimes they do just stick out there. Again, in the description, if you'd like to follow the, the listings, I've added the link for you to have a look at. And we're going to be jumping through a lot of these that are continuations. And Megan says that Royal Oak is very rare worth every dollar. The, the gray dial, yeah. I, I think it's the colors that, that grabbed me at first. And Turbo mentioning, many Asians, myself included, are allergic to alcohol. That's why we turn red in the face. Fascinating. I've never, never heard of that before. I mean, I have friends who get it from, from red wine, and it has to do with the sulfites and all of that, right? I'm guessing it's, it's like a, it's a reaction to the sulfite levels in a lot of alcohol. Oh, fascinating. Thanks for that, Turbo. It's a beautiful watch. And this is, this is the stuff I like talking about. I'm so sick of the modern stuff. The, the vintage things, I mean, given the chance, the vintage catalogs just have so many things to offer. And this, to me, is just so much inspiration in this. You know? Okay, taking it from the coffee, and we're jumping to lot 820. We're on a good range of motion. Now, this is an original radio mirror, which is why it's worth looking at. This being a 1958 I mean, I'm sure Thomas and a couple of others in the chat will be frothing at one of these. Reference 6152. Love to do an extended history on the, the Radio Mirror and the Luminor. Panerai just has that in spades. Their history is insanely cool. So what do we have? So Matsutori, this being four. I'm guessing the Italian police. So Matsutori. I'm trying to remember. Hold on, hold on. I mean, that's all to do with the, the sea dweller that was given in the 80s to, I think it is the police. Someone might need to correct me. Any Italians in the chat, let me know. <laughs> but the, I mean, the great thing is that the crystal is probably original. The dial is all nice and clean. We have number one mentioned here. I guess that's that's to the, the group. Yeah, I, I just love it. Very seldom do we see vintage panorais come up for auction. And this went for a million. So what is that? I'm not going to try and do maths and embarrass myself here. What's that, like 100 grand that it went for? That's probably completely off. Anyway, hitting the water as the police. Thank you, Koji. So it is. Okay, fantastic. It's beautiful. From 1958. I mean, just think back to that time. The time of you know, innovation when everyone was starting to test these new technologies. And, of course, Panerai and these, these watches, especially the radio mirrors, they'd been around for 20 years at that stage, even more. And they'd been used as the original dive watches. I can't wait to talk more about these pieces in future. About the French military, I think the Italian military needs to be next. Next to German, I don't know. I'll do one of those two next. Um, I'm still not into Panerai. I'm trying really hard to like this one. Design Atelier, you know what it is? I, um, I like to think not only about the, the overall design that you see, but I think the time of when it was made is also something to factor in. I love the fact that it, prior to legibility being a thing that everyone jumped on, this for its size was just so excellent as, and again, the, the thing that really draws me to it is that the symmetry on the dial, that the numerals, I love a sandwich dial, it just adds more depth to it, character. This being radio mirror, meaning that it is a, it is a, a, a radium dial. I think that's the one like definitive element that they, they focused on back then. That's just gorgeous. Of course, I should flick through some of these listings to have a look at. Another thing to mention, Rolex movements, because that's what they were doing. Rolex, not only did the cases, but I think also Brevet, of course, Brevet being for the crown protection system. These watches at this time were part bin specials. It's the hardest thing to, to believe. Rolex supplied movements. That's awesome history. I mean, I really look forward to discussing these in the future. Um, not a watch for everyone, as you will see throughout these shows, but stunning watch. I don't, they mentioned 47 millimeters in diameter. Can you believe that? 1958, a real dive computer of its time. <laughs> and make a yes rads model. I mean, that would be good. Right? That would be really nice. Have that centered on the dial. Okay, I'm going to carry on to 821. 
I've got to, got to keep a consistent time going on here or else, oh, look at that thing. 806, we love. And you might notice that I'm pausing as I scratch out. I've got a, a pen next to me. I'm scratching out all the, all the numbers as we roll through. This is a really nice example of an 806. And surprisingly, look at the estimates between 60 and 100, and it went for 113, just over the estimate, which is sad in a way. It's good for us because they are still available, and you can find 806s around. But this being that that definitive Navi timer, the, the way the dial's been arranged, there's some in the chat, I think, that owned the, the 765 or the 806 reissue. Oh, it's just so nice. It's just a, a watch of its time, 1959. So just when that Panerai was around, we noticed that same time we see this being set up. One of the most illegible pilot watches around, one of the most complicated machines that you can get for presentation and when you think of the planes that they were flying at that time i mean they were just moving into the edge of the jet and still trying to hold your arm steady to read this thing flying you know at superb speeds how do you even manage to to use it for its intended purpose but it's great it's amazing actually i've been of course i'm not a pilot never flown in my life uh, you know commercially i've never taught myself to fly we do have some pilots watching but it's it's pretty amazing how you have to when when you're in you know if you're a fighter pilot or whatever else you have to a lot of the time manually calculate your fuel time and how much fuel you have left and watches of of course you have a, a clock on your on your dashboard but having one on your wrist to actually you know determine how much fuel you have left and timing the burn and all of that stuff really important so it it might feel anachronistic but even today it's very important to have an instrument to help you calculate fuel especially in the plane. Um, okay, hopping in. I see Chaz. Chaz, I don't know if I said hi. Welcome. Uh, that Pam and this Navi would make an awesome, oh, tell me what, two watch set. Absolutely. Icons of their time, very difficult to compete. Uh, what's not to love about this? It's it's my favorite. I think it is also my favorite Navi timer in this category. I know it's, it's not everyone's favorite. They've got so many today that it's difficult, but this one really does hone in on that, that origin. Oh, it's beautiful. Hitting the coffee. We've been going now for 26 minutes, and I feel like I've found my feet, kind of, sort of, jumping to lot 822. Now, why did I focus on this? I think we've seen a lot of these. It's quite amazing how these Pateks just crop up during these shows. This one sold for a lot, like a lot, a lot. Estimate between 12 and 23, and it went for 15. Okay, well, maybe not as much as we expected, but there's... There's a couple of these in the show that I think are worth noting, and I just did that for the sake of, of variety. We're going to see those later on. Uh, highly important, exceedingly, I mean, just look at this, exceedingly rare. I know they've gotten to a point where they're saying things like uber rare and all this stuff. They're just getting more, more and more into it. Uh, perpetual, of course, is being a perpetual chronograph. That's 37 and a half mils in size. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? Uh, it's stunning though. I don't, doesn't look like it has, it does. So it does have a stepped case, but it looks like it's been polished in its life. Magic mouse, work with me here. It looks like it has been polished in its life, but even still, pretty amazing piece of its time, 1953. Believe it or not, that's, that's the amazing thing I love about watchmaking more than anything else, is that these movements look as relevant now as they did back then. And it's, it's crazy to think that all these years later, I think this even had a video discussion around it. All these years later, these watches still just, just captivate us uh, by their presentations and how well they work. Timelessness, you know. Yellow gold is, is out of favor, I think. Megan, do they prefer white gold or platinum? Interesting point, because I, I don't know if this is true, but a lot of the time people say that yellow gold is normally the, the least made of these watches. I don't know if that's the same with all pieces, but... Uh, yellow gold is also the, the most scarce in a lot of these categories. But I think it's beautiful. I think yellow gold for this kind of watch suits it. 37 mils. I mean, that's it's amazing. Uh, did I miss something? Uh, Italian calendar, never seen one. Design Atelier, good point. Very good point. I did not notice that either. Very good eye. Italian calendar. I didn't even notice. It's, it's an enamel dial by the looks of things too. So there's lots of little facets to take in. And what I love to do with these examples, especially when we have... A, a 37 millimeter case and you notice how large that crown is on the side just try and put that into perspective how massive that crown looks that's fun it's just that the age of proportions and scale and there's there's so much to take away from these kinds of examples yeah i love it okay moving to a23 we're on track oh okay 
Now, there's a reason why I chose this, of course, because it's, it's a beautiful Explorer. This being 6610, not a, not a 1016, the precursor. More often than not, the way you can determine whether this is a earlier variant or if it is a 1016 is because we have a railroad minute track. Uh, this having a white seconds hand and of course it has a stamping of kw and co i don't know must be a jeweler from back in the day beautiful piece though i just i love it and the best thing of all wanted to mention this that the bracelets being a flat link uh sorry flat end what's the best word? straight end bracelets uh forstner forstner bands are making these now so you can actually buy a proper stretch rivet forstner band just like this today and I believe that gay, this was a gay Frey bracelet back then. And I think Forstner now owns the rights to, to making these bracelets. I don't know. might be wrong. But they are really cool. And who doesn't like a gilt dial? It's beautiful. I mean, just the example itself, the sharpness of the case, the lugs, the dial is so neat and clean. You would swear this thing has never been worn all its life. It's just amazing. Uh, that being 300 grand. Hold on a sec. Was that, was that Raymond? Was that for the... Uh, the, the earlier, earlier rest estimate of the Patek. Sorry, sorry. The Vintage Explorer is drool worthy. It is, it is. And it is, I'm surprised it's 36. I would expect this to be a 34 mil diameter model, but oh, it's just so great. I mean, we can just end the show here. It's it's beautiful. Presentation wise, the, the finishing, the fact that it's so sharp for its age, 1957. Again, another icon of its time. I so wish they were still making these things. Mm. Anyway, it's a, it's a goodie. Eric, welcome. Better late than never. Welcome to the show and watch and pray. Great to have you here. Mentioning that the rivet bracelet is so underrated. I agree. I think rivets just add a dynamic to a watch that is hard to beat, really. The stretch the stretch rivet, especially. The only downside is you have to size it so it's a bit tighter around the wrist, but then it conforms. And then it's, it's as comfortable as a fabric strap if you manage to size it properly. Very seldom that you see these watches on straight end bracelets too, which is also a nice touch. You can imagine that back then, these bracelets were quite difficult to come across because you know they're pretty expensive to make. Manufacturing was was a hectic thing, and we must also remember that these were all parts bin specials even back then. Beautiful, just beautiful. Roar of the Tiger says you're correct on Forstner. I'm a knucklehead and bought the NASA mesh from them. Yeah, they have they have all of them here. Huh? They're doing very good. Um, I have the the, the flat link. The, the rivet braces. Stunning. Okay, hop into 824. So we notice that there is some consistency and then there's some not. Now there's a handful of these 1675s and I've deliberately selected them all so we can see the differences. There's some examples with eagle beaks, some with jubilees, some with much neater bezels that aren't faded. So it's all good. It's stuff that we can we can compare and contrast. This also looking like a gilt dial. Yeah, it's it's a gem. Of course, they say extremely rare and well-preserved. I mean, how many 1675s do we see today? <laughs> it's it's hilarious. There's there are many more extremely rare watches out there. Hold on a sec. Why did this move around? This should be zoomed in a bit more. Hold on. Getting it centered a bit easier for us to see. So being a pointed crown guard, okay, okay. So this being the variant after the Eagle Beak, 1964, pretty much the golden era for these watches. And the condition is just amazing. It has a rivet bracelet, as you would expect. Uh, the case, the, the beautiful thing is that the case is nice and sharp. Uh, it's stunning. And it's just the way they designed these things back then. They were so flat in profile. They had this, this formula to the way they designed their cases and, and used them. Yeah, you'll notice a couple of vintage Rolexes I've highlighted here. Uh, it is, it's a charmer. It's a charmer. The cons yeah, the consistency. You wouldn't call this a Bart Simpson, no, because the, the crown's a little bit long. It's not, doesn't look like his head exactly. Yeah, it's great. Love, I love the fact that it's even, it's pretty much untouched. It has been worn. It's been well worn, but it's still good nick. And I think that's that's important. Okay, gonna hop to eight. There's a couple more of these later on. Eight two five next. I think this is another vintage Rolex. If I remember right. Ooh, who doesn't love a five five one three? Bracelet made for Comex. Hold on a second. Helium escape valve. I did not notice this. I just like the condition of the watch. So this is a pre Comex. Wow. Wow, that adds something to it. And you notice the case back will probably have Comex stamped. Again, watches of the French Armed Forces. If you're catching up with the show, corner, corner of the screen, you should see a link to it if you'd like to learn more about that uh, at a later stage. Diving literature from the original owner. That's great. This, these are very special. We're talking, these are, these are very rare. 
uh, the early precursors before they actually had Comex printer. These were the real prototypes. And this being a submariner, this being the pre-sea dweller, of course. This is like right at that stage. Amazing. Very nice. I actually prefer this over the 1675, sorry to say. Uh, I think that little bit of extra provenance linked to the, the helium escape valve. I'm surprised they don't actually give you a side-on image to see that. They do they? Oh, they, I think they do. They think they do. There we go. There's your original little helium escape valve on the side that was uh, still patent pending back then. I love it. Love it. Special, rare and attractive, however you want to say. They don't say attractive very often anymore, I don't think. I think they've, they've caught on to the fact that we make fun of them because of it. The original paperwork is where it really sings. I mean, there are some awesome stories when, when these divers go into to jewelers handing these over with the full logbook and everything there. I love it. That's just adds a lot. The sad thing is we're at the stage where, I mean, would you actually wear this watch? That's what I find just irritating about this hobby now. These watches were worn religiously for like 30 years, 30 plus years. These original owners hand them over and these things are now handled with kit gloves for the rest of their lives. They're never taken out, worn as just as freely anymore. I mean, we, we can talk about them being antiques at this stage, of course, but then it's like, it just ruins the fun. You're spending so much money on these things and you're like, okay, what are you doing it for? Are you going to just lock it up in a safe or are you actually going to get some, some fun out of these things? Yeah. Megan loves these lots. I mean, how can you not? 5513 is a gem. They have added important in the, in, the, in place of attractive. Yeah, it's uh, the literature. They mentioned literature here as well, so that's something. Yeah, great example. I love the cleanliness of the dial too. 100% um, wear the watch as I... Yeah, I mean, Megan, that's it. Some, some of us out there would probably do the bad thing and wear a watch like this. I mean, why wouldn't you? It's... It's sad. Unfortunately, now the collector space is just so clued up about what these watches are about that the prices of these just, mm, it just ruins the experience. Anyway, hopping to 831. I like this watch. So it's a centigraph. Of course, now you've noticed I've skipped what, nine or something? I don't know. I'm not counting. Four or five watches there. So uh, I see Mr. GMT saying, I own this watch, but I wish I had this one of my favorite watches of all time, especially, yeah, being stamped. Yeah. It's amazing, really is. Looks like an Invicta, Dan says. I mean, you could say they share the same language, right? Mooseman says the problem is that if you dive with a rebreather equipment, you need a diving computer anyway for respiratory gas control. Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about security and all of that stuff and being sure that you know what you're doing in the water, it's, it's helpful having all of that equipment. A proper depth gauge is a very good thing to start with. But then again, how many of us are going to be diving beyond 25 meters 25 meters is hella deep. I don't know if anyone knows that, but it's it's stupidly deep. It already starts to get dark at that level. Hitting coffee. Justin says, sometimes I wonder if the people that buy these are running a museum. Some do, for sure. And unfortunately, it's just, they move into this pantheon. It's, it's the strangest thing. I try and wrap my head around it. Again, I'm not a watch collector, so I'm not someone who can really give you any kind of insight or anything valid talking about experience and all of that, but I just find it so perplexing that these objects now move away from being just everyday watches that you can enjoy and now turn into these things that are left on velvet cushions for the rest of their lives. Anyway, 831, centigraph. I think it's con I think it is called a centigraph, or is this a precursor? 2009, oh, it is a centigraph, got it, got it. Rose gold, brown strap, beautiful presentation. It is a watch that's starting to grow on me, especially when it has a leather strap. It's a little bit more casual. It's not so in your face. And of course, we know FB Jeans are going for stupid money at the moment, unfortunately, but a lot of us can enjoy them just for the sake of their watchmaking. And it's, it's understandable to talk about watchmaking prowess and him creating all of these amazing movements. Uh, underachieving, can't go vintage, I'm a watch abuser. Yep, same as me. I'm not someone who necessarily takes care of the watches, but uh, it's a weird thing. I think we are all running our own private museum at home. Just, I mean, that's it. We, <laughs> good point, Megan. Yeah, beautiful. Nice presentation. I do love the colors, the contrasts, the grays. Stunning. Okay, up and across to 832. Right, next up. This one deserves lots of love. Funny enough, I haven't done many videos on Patek, but I have on this, the 5959 pretty much the precursor to the 5370 that we know today. This was 
the one of the first, as far as I know, one of the first in-house chronograph movements that Patek ever made. This watch is tiny. It's 33 millimeters in size. A I mean, the presentation is, is enough to make you drool. It's beautiful. The straight lugs, very Breguet-esque, Breguet hands. I, I absolutely adore this watch. The size eh, could be a 36, but then this, what makes it special, 2007, this is when they lost their Geneva seal and they started their own Patek Philippe seal. I think this is the watch that really defined it then. And it's it's beautiful. I mean, it's a split chrono. It's I, I love the white. There's also a black dial with white numerals, which is just as amazing, which I would recommend you look at. Reference 5959. I think they also made them in, in white gold. I'm trying to remember. But this being the platinum, exceptional. This watch went for 1.89, estimate between 1.2 and 2, 2 mil. Yeah, I think it's I think it's deserving. Oh, I enjoy it. I really enjoy looking at it. All the little things. The best thing of all is that it was Patek's like first in-house movement that they were able to to really give their own seal of approval. The size, I wish it was bigger, but the presentation, it's a real little, you know, it feels like a World War One officer's watch in a way. Okay, getting into the chat before we switch to the next piece. Love the crown, Roar of the Tiger says. It's amazing. It's a single pusher. Well, it's technically a double pusher, but I love the crown there as well. It's It's just beautiful. And I see Tim Mosso's N95 mask is joining us. Welcome. It's always a pleasure having you here. One of the most inventive names on this page, and I love it. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and Raymond, you guys are chatting amongst yourselves. Sorry about that. Uh, don't like, sorry that I should say, sorry that I can't read what's going on. I'm trying to like skim through. Don't like the hands on this, this watch. The, they call them spade style hands, right? Yeah, maybe Breguet hands would be better. It's it's peculiar that they use Breguet uh, counterbalances for the the seconds for the chronograph seconds, but not the hands. Uh, there's so it's almost like there's a spade style here and a leaf style on the on the minutes. I kind of like it. It breaks it up a little bit more. It does work in a way with the Breguet numerals on the dial. I just love it. I mean, look at that seven. It's like a it's like a a fifties teddy boy haircut. You know, it has that curl over the top. Yeah, and thirty three being the same size as World War Two. A11s, yes, Roar of the Tiger, you're right. So another thing I wanted to mention, and it's just slipped my mind, um, the reason why they've made them so small was not necessarily to show off anything. I mean, in a way, it's pretty special that this being the definitive watch that like gave them that seal of approval. But of course, in the competition of making the thinnest watch, it's also something notable when a brand can make such a tiny watch and fit so much into it. And you notice that the movement fills up the entire space of it, which I find amazing. I really like that factor. Yeah, great. Really nice. Looks like a collected man sent this watch in, judging by the strap. Jumping to 834 next. What am I missing on 833? Oh, it's a longer. We've seen a lot of these. White gold, dual time. It's a couple of longers that I've highlighted. Uh, but this one... Yeah, it's good, but I mean, there's there's more variety to come. This one was the one to look at. Almost finished the finished the first row of watch. <laughs> I've got four rows of lots to cover. So the first row, we're like two thirds of the way through it. We're doing pretty well. Been running the show for forty two minutes. This is good. <laughs> Justin saying spade and leaf. Is this a garden watch? Yeah, the names we come up with. I mean, what would we call these? Are kind of assegai sword hands. This is a beautiful. I think it's an eighteen fifteen, as far as I know. I th uh, one of five, five of okay, sorry, five of twenty. So they made twenty of these examples. This is a beast of a watch. Two thousand and eighteen, forty-two mils in size. The way you can generally denote that it's an eighteen fifteen is because of the numerals on the dial, I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong there. Pity that Russell's not here with us. He would uh, he would enjoy this piece. But it's beautiful. The navy dial. I'm trying to okay, let's read through the fluff here. Extremely rare. Uh, split second perpetual calendar. Yes. Moon phases, leap year indicator. Ooh. Power reserve indication, blue enamel dial. Okay, that's something awesome. Hinged enamel case back. I didn't know they did a hinged enamel back. Look at that thing. Yeah, it's nice. I mean, estimate between 1.1, 2.3, and it went for 4.6. Uh. And we notice just here how Lunga is getting some attention. It's kind of prevalent. And this is where the interest is now moving. Uh, it's And you've, you notice that I have trimmed a lot of the, the stainless steel sports modern stuff out just so we can enjoy these these more varied pieces. Yeah, beautiful presentation. There are some exceptional Lungas from back in the day that I would recommend you looking at, uh, especially in that transitional period of like the, the late 90s, early 2000s. They were doing some really cool things with their bracelets, uh, especially with the Lunga 1s. And yeah, 
lots to take in. Killer, killer Lunger giving PP a run for their money. I mean, this is a 2018 model, Raymond. Uh, was it Raymond? Yeah. 2018 model. So pretty good. I didn't know it was so recent. But of course, the one downside I find with these pieces, just call me a snob, but the idea of having these little pushes on the sides to adjust the calendars and things, it, it feels, I know it's not true because, I mean, it's it's a very complicated piece, but it feels almost like an afterthought whenever I see those things there. Damn it, this mouse. Can't it just cover? There we go. You see those little pushes on the side. I don't know why the tab gives me the full description of the watch, but there we go. You get the idea. It's also quite a thick thing. If you're looking at this live, you can scroll to the bottom of the actual description of these watches and see the full spec sheet if you would like. There's a, there's a full essay assigned to all of these pieces. So... Do they tell you about case thickness? Uh, no, they don't. They don't. They only tell you about the diameter of it, sadly. Ah, oh, it's beautiful. And now that I've done this, I've, there we go, if I corrected it, good. Jumping to A35 next. Beautiful. Let's get to the chat again. Oh, why did I choose this watch? Not because it's a Rolex, but because it's a beautiful Rolex, and I wish they were still making these today. This is a date just. This is a gold date just. Why are they not making these anymore? A solid gold model. Love it. Um, so, so Watch and Pray says, I love a longer, just can't qualify to get one. I mean, today they are dropping quite a lot on the secondary market. So I guess you could look then. But that's the thing. We talk about these brands a lot, but would we actually want to own one ourselves? It's, it's a difficult thing. These are not cheap machines. And so this, on the other hand, between 100 and 200 was the estimate. It went for 189. So I'm guessing, what is that, 18,000, basically 19,000 dollars us dollars oh it's so nice and of course what is this is this 18 or i uh, don't tell you the, the carrots here but anyway uh it looks they mentioned carrots somewhere on the stamping no maybe someone can help me out but you can see over time this is oxidized and it's just beautiful 1952 look at that presentation this being before we see the the cyclops being integrated it's a roulette date wheel. It's just, there's so much to enjoy. I love the hands. Why don't they play with these hands anymore? Dauphine style was like a definitive trait that they used through the 50s. We noticed that a lot with the dive watches and all of those examples, like solid big batons that you can read the time on. Yeah, great piece. Reference 6104, gold rivet, as mentioned by, by Watch and Pray. It's, yeah, it's amazing. As, and Megan also mentioning classy distinguished, it is. It's just, it's subtle understated still the 36 mil size you notice that we were moving out of that cushion case era and you can actually see at the base where the lug is no it's, it's still got a separate extension of the case flank which is kind of true to what we saw with with bubble backs i love it it's it's a beautiful beautiful example there's another one later on that we will see this really is a perfect gold and black watch why don't they make more of these i mean what's not to love I'm not someone who loves dates on watches, but you want something to define the date just, make solid gold. Why not? Uh, I mean, they make, nowadays, they make so many, so much variety in this area. Why can't they just do this too? Yeah, I love it. This is what I love about these shows is that you get to see the quirks of watches from the bygone era, we could say. Okay, jumping to A36 next, and this also worth looking at, 6241. Six, how many four-digit Daytonas have we seen during these auctions? Lots, tons. But I think the way this has been arranged, even without the bracelets, mm, extremely rare. And yeah, yeah. 1969, just a great reverse panda dial. Uh, it's, it's very seldom that we see that kind of contrast on watches today. I love the fact that these vintage Daytonas, from a, a functionality point of view, of course, they weren't, they weren't the fashionable thing to own back then, but today we see them and they just have this idea of being instruments first and not these, these uh, fashion accessories that we are noticing now. I love the fact that it's so legible, even though it has so much going on and beautiful. Of course, the case is oxidized. They don't tell you the actual metal, so it's hard to tell if it's nine carat or if it's 18 and normally we can actually judge where the market was originally, where this watch was sold. I think the American market was all nine carat and the European market was 18 carat. So that would be a nice touch if they included it. I guess I could scroll to the description, but that'll be a pain. Um, I see Rick joining us. Welcome. Great to have you here. I love that article you shared about the time and tide story. Highly recommend having a look at their latest article on the Nautilus scam that's been going on. Watch and Pray says, I like to think I have the modern interpretation of this one. See Avatar. 
Oh, that's the new. Oh, okay, I got it, got it. That's the um with the gold subdials and the ceramic bezel. Yeah, it's a nice piece, and I'm pretty sure that's the inspiration they drew on to make this piece a thing, to make the modern one possible. It's beautiful. It is. It's gorgeous. And and Chaz saying timepiece is greater than status symbol. Fourteen. Thank you, Wesley. So this is a fourteen carat model. I don't know if this is the example. So this being the this being an American market model, then if that's the case, correct me if I'm wrong. You know, unfortunately, we are also moving into the stage where, uh, I mean, these watches are now becoming status symbols instead of just being beautiful pieces of design. And they deserve they deserve attention for being, I mean, take the name off the dial. Is this not a gorgeous piece? If this was a Hoya Carrera, I'd be giving it the same praise. I think it deserves that. Unfortunately, people only want to buy the name today. So this went between, this was going to go between 1.1 and 1.9. Went for the in between of 1.7. So what is that? 180 ish thousand US dollars. And Megan likes it too. Yeah, it's beautiful. It is beautiful. Okay, hopping across to A37. So we notice that these batches do come in batches. Uh, okay. Next up, extremely fine yellow gold perpetual calendar. The reason why I like this one so much, it went for an insane amount of money. I just picked it up thinking it looked so good. I loved the black dial and the yellow contrast. Not for everyone. Perpetual uh, Royal Oaks are definitely peculiar. From 1986, can you believe? And they're still making them today. They are still making them today. Uh, and that has all the all the provenance. I think it's got a, a signed document from the from the owner. This is really nice. I love those engravings. You notice today that you don't get that kind of beautification done with script and text and everything there of course back then they didn't have a clear case back for you to see the movement so you just had to kind of take it in the watch is so thin i don't even know if it was automatic or if it was a manual wine back then this is crazy beautiful looking piece though and uh, of course the collector market what between between 780 1.5 it went for 3.2 3.3 so basically what 340,000 i hope I'm, i hope i'm getting these numbers right Megan gave me a bit of a conversion table. Yeah, stunning. Okay, hopping in. Neil's saying that. Shame people are only into the Rolex name. Yeah, it's unfortunate. But, for, I mean, for us, the good thing is that there is a lot more to look at out there. Uh, there's a lot more variety. Where, where the attention is, you move in the complete opposite direction, and you can find amazing stuff. Uh, Raymond mentioning 14 karat gold for the American market and Europe 18. Thank you, Raymond. That helps. That helps a lot. So this being, I'm pretty sure this being 18 karat uh, these watches were definitely more popular in Europe at the time. But this is a beautiful watch. I know not everyone can get on board with the, the AP aesthetic. Uh, this is not just an AP. I think it also resembles a lot. I like the fact, especially with these, that it's almost like a middle finger to the sports watch. It was established as the sports dress machine. But now you have it in solid yellow gold, which makes it more of a dress object. And of course, with a full perpetual calendar inside... It goes even further against the idea of it being a sports watch, in, in quotes. Bobby Legs, I'm, I'm so un upset because before my show started, I was checking out your unboxing of your Kodoki, and I missed it. It was like there's seven minutes for this thing to go, the clip to go, and I was <laughs> just about to sit down. It was like two minutes before the show began. So bobby legs check out his latest video because he just picked up a real grail worthy piece and it's beautiful i have to congratulate you on that um okay so we're jumping to lot 839 this being a 145022 from 1970 this being the the true professional you know once we've hit that stage we've gone beyond the transitional stuff this is where the professional model lies tropical dial i don't know if they'd switched out calibers yet someone with more knowledge will be able to tell me 861 there we go helps having the the signed document so this was no longer the 321 movement but who doesn't love a tropical dial anything yeah it's really nice and another cool thing notice how they've matched the dial with the uh the leather strap distressed leather gotta say they managed to dress these watches up nicely for their presentations it's good to see it's almost like a think of it as like a fashion show in a way you know hopping in and you're seeing colors being paired with the finish of the dial and everything there between 60 and 100 was the expected go for and it went for 138 wow so for what 15 ish grand crazy okay hitting the coffee again this is a very mild coffee today so hopefully it won't completely wreck my brain we're going pretty well getting on getting on form we're in motion 
again, Bobby Legs, I have to congratulate you. Such a such a cool watch. It's it's great when again when when the attention is in other places when you can just hop onto these amazing pieces. So I look forward to seeing that review. That was a really good segue. I just stumbled on that before the show began. There's a couple more Speedmasters that I've highlighted, uh, and I don't think there are many that are like the precursors, the transitionals. There are a couple of professional cases, though. Okay, going to 840 next. Let's mark that down. Ah, oh, now we're jumping. The Eterna. Is this considered a – it is a Contiki. So this was, the, this was the hotly contested watch, Megan says. Yeah, I mean, what did it go for? Between 15 and 31, it went for 82 grand. Wow. So what, that's, that's – Eight point five, eight thousand five hundred dollars. I hope I'm getting this. Beautiful. I mean, this is the kind of watch that I want to focus these shows on. I love the fact that, especially in Hong Kong, they are looking at the outliers more. They're sharing our passion for the peculiar instead of just the typical stuff. This watch looks brand spanking new. I mean, the lugs are sharp. Doesn't even look like it's been polished. Original box. Uh, I don't even know if this is a Gen 1 Contiki. I uh, might need some help, some assistance from 1970. I feel like this being a later variant. We'd moved away from the core to Arabic phases, and this is now like the next step. And of course, it just you know epitomizes the 70s aesthetic. We have orange second hand, beautiful orange rail dial like inset there, and uh, you've got this oblong date window. Even the, even the bezel, this looks like a countdown bezel, which is also something a bit strange for its time. You wouldn't imagine seeing countdown bezels in this, but look at it. It's brand new. I love it. Just so, so cool. Uh, I see Mark P is joining us. Welcome. You're not joining late. Don't worry. It's only like 50 minutes, the show. Who knows how long it's going to be. Um, Tourista says, I like dress watches, but I feel strange when I wear the dress. Don't we all? Don't we all? It's the most irritating thing. I mean, I don't know how ladies do it. You know, the skirts right up the crotch and all that stuff. Anyway, uh, carrying on. That's not a hammer, Eric. <laughs> Mjolnir. Oh, there was a mention about who owned this watch. Sorry, I missed the chat there, but uh, awesome. Tim, welcome. Welcome to the show. We are just sitting back. I hope you're all drinking something good and you're enjoying yourselves. Listening to me prattle on about these peculiar and sometimes beautiful examples. Contiki was first, oh, here we go, 1953. Thank you, Raymond. Contiki was first introduced by Turner, 53. So this being that transitional watch of its time. And you see it, the cigarette hands. Oh, it's so nice. I love the condition of it too. Okay, jumping over to 841. Here we go, another watch in this row. For those of you who are now just joining, I do have a crib note of about 120-ish watches that I've highlighted so we are going to avoid a lot of the fluff and stick to the stuff that's worth looking at, which will save us a lot of time, I think, and will save me a trip to the hospital. Right, to reference 166.024, not being the 165, bear in mind, the 165 reference has the Arabic, the 166 is the model with the date. Oh, I love it. It's, it's the MOD dive watch. It's got everything there. I mean, if they had to bring out this watch again, Omega, anyone who's watching, please, please do us all a favor. The condition of this is amazing. Bracelet looks all original. The case is also superb. 42 mil diameter. I've been very fortunate to wear one of these before, and they are they are simply stunning. I would happily, I mean, Submariner Dreams, put them aside and get one of these watches if they ever had to bring out one of these as a reissue. Yeah, it's just great. I mean, how much more do I need to gush about this thing? There's there's at least five like pretty recent videos I've done on these watches because I love them so much. The Seamaster 300, this being that transitional model. Call it the first professional Seamaster, which is a good way. Uh, before that, we had the straight lugs. This is the one that really defined it. And later on, we're going to see an even better example of a 165 reference later on. Amazing. Gladiator sword hands. Yeah, Justin, it, it has it all. I mean, I've gushed about this way too long. This was just my time to uh, to chat. Uh, great bracelet mentioned by, by Watch and Pray. Flat link bracelet wears so differently to others out there it has its own it must be strange trying these out i've never tried a vintage one of these they look very light and and airy beautiful though i love the, the condition of the dial it's stunning another thing to notice is that to tell if these are genuine by the way the, are you entertained i love that watch and pray um are you not entertained the uh at the top and at the base of the dial i don't know if you'll see this but they're two tiny like pinpricks and i believe that is how the the dial was applied 
those are like the connecting points for the dial to the movement. And that's a good way to determine whether or not they're genuine. You might have to squint, <laughs> squint at the screen to see that spec. But yeah, it's just great. It's just awesome. Better bracelet they make now. Yeah, they, they better bracelet than they make now. I think for these these models, the flat links for the reissues, they are great. I know they're having problems with their more modern ones, the professionals, which is worth discussing. Uh, okay, jumping to 842. We'll be here all night. Oh, come on. Look at that thing. Look at that thing. Crossing that off the list. Reference E558. I've never seen one of these before. Just a typical example of a watch from the 70s. JLC. Beautiful script on the dial. Look at that. Master Mariner Deep Sea. A new old stock on a classic rubber B, not a rubber B, what am I saying? Tropic strap. It's probably being an original Tropic as well, untouched. It's got a cushion case. It's like, it's sharp. The case is in great condition. Between 48 and 78 was the estimate. It went for 150. So what's that, like 15 grand? No, a little bit more maybe, or a little bit less. I don't know. But I mean, think about the watch that you're getting here. It's just, it's crazy to think where the attention is, is going and where we can appreciate these peculiarities. Time for me to have whiskey then. Oh, Megan, it's like five in the morning. That's so six in the morning. I wouldn't recommend whiskey yet. I think it's a bit early, but uh, <laughs> to, to each their own. Compressor for sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, gotta love it. Just, it's so, so nice. I think maybe one of the downsides is that it's very uh, sparse with the loom. You notice there's only loom on the quarters. But just look at the thing. I love the fact that Hong Kong specifies this. this is the only reason why I'm doing this show, actually. I was I was a bit over it, didn't want to do another four hour show. But then when these kinds of pieces crop up, they deserve to be looked at and appreciated. Yeah. They are just very charming. Okay, eight four three. And I think we get another really good example coming up next. Let's see. It is ooh, Sea Dweller. This being just after we saw the Submariner with the uh, the helium valve, this being a more legitimate 1665, beautiful condition. Another watch to enjoy. Look at that dial. The hands are original. It's just neat and tidy. You don't see these very often. Uh, what else? Helium escape valve, of course, what makes it definitive. Has all the paperwork and the boxes, which is great. I mean, talk about collector provenance. And unfortunately, the, the person who bought this watch for shall we say, $28,000, $29,000, is probably not going to wear this thing. It's going to go into a into a vault somewhere, never see the light of day again, sadly. Yep, that's the, the state of affairs that we're living in today. Because these are antiques, we can define them as that, but still, it's just uh, it's a gem, real gem. How many times have we discussed these watches before? A lot. So we're going to skip through a lot of these pieces, I think, <laughs> eventually. Megan's saying Irish coffee. It's funny, I've never gotten into Irish coffee. I've tried it a couple of times, but I prefer my, my drinks separate. I don't know why. should be done. I mean, it's a much more efficient way, <laughs> much, much more efficient way of getting the drink down. But uh, yeah, good luck, Megan, if that's your start. Because I mean, you're going to be at the auction later on. So that should be fun, going in there with a the buzz on. Okay, okay, I'm going to move on to 844. Okay, that's great. So we've got a nice selection. <clears throat> and here's a Comex, of course, the next step up. This being even more rare and attractive. They actually said attractive here and rare. Oh, there we go. They swapped it around. <laughs> That's good. I mean, at least they're, they're on their toes. 1991, this being like one of the last models down there. Hmm. Forbin mentioning 1665 versus 1655. Interesting Rolex numbering. It is, right? I mean, they're just the complete opposites on the spectrum. You're going to see two of those 1655s later on. This is also in great nick. Look at that top lug. It looks untouched. The bottom lugs, though, that uneven polishing uh, gets me. But then you have the paperwork. I don't know if you have all the provenance linked to it, but of course, that's what you want to see. And another thing is, I mean, the beauty of these auctions is that you have that assurance that you're getting a legitimate model. Can you imagine spending, excuse me, a million Hong Kong dollars, which is, which is over 100,000 US dollars on a watch that has a fake case back? I mean, that happens, eh? Someone puts a, a fake replica Comex case back on the watch and you've just, oh, it's crazy. I mean, hold on a sec. John Mayer, didn't he have a mill sub that was that was not a legitimate model? And that was a whole like thing that made headlines. Yeah, it's cool. It's a really nice example that the, the saturation divers out there would love this piece for many reasons. 
happy hour in the Berg, Justin R says. Yeah, sorry that I'm not keeping up with you in the chat. Um, Eric says, look at the symmetry of the stacked C, S. I think we were looking at an earlier model there, Eric. Sorry that I missed you again. Yeah, tagging me in the chat will help. 30 years seals, risk it, watch and pray. I mean, what's, you could you could easily replace the seals. It doesn't take a lot of effort. Uh, someone tell me how to keep a working watch in that condition. Yeah, I mean, Eric, you are a culprit when it comes to your watches. You just you just destroy them. Funny story about Eric is that he had a Sea Dweller 43, and within the first week, he had managed to like scuff the sapphire crystal cleaning barnacles off the bottom of a boat, I think. That was the story. Yeah, I love it. I love it when work watches are actually being used. Now, this one, this is the only modern day toner we are going to look at, I think. I mean, these we, we know these designs, these cases are so ubiquitous today. But this one's cool, man. This is a prototype dial. This deserves a lot of intrigue, introspection. What does this mean? 1987. I'm by no means a Daytona nut, unfortunately. I have some great friends who know their Daytonas in and out. Sadly, I'm not one of them. 16520. I would imagine this is like the origin, the real precursor to the Patrizzi dials and all of those pieces. A prototype dial arrangement. I love this. Don't you think it looks cool? Why don't they make more of these? It's it's just, again, clean, uncluttered. It doesn't have anything wrong. This being the, the Zenith movements, I would imagine back then, they just made 100% sure that this is a legitimate thing. I can't read what that says. Uh, it's probably it's probably Asia and Docs. Oh, it says Singer on it. Hmm. Don't know why. Maybe someone can help me out. Yeah, great. Just a great example. Re the, the thing that really catches me is just how nicely that dial's been done. And why don't more brands do this today? I love it. Presentation's great. Russell, welcome. You haven't missed much. We have just been flitting in and out. I've got a checklist of things that I'm saving that we're going to look at, uh, which is going to help us with time management this time around. Uh, saves me from going to hospital. Uh, Giza says the Rolex Passion. Yeah, Philip Stahl. Yeah, he has a blue dial. I have seen it. And this one made the rounds on social media, of course, because you don't see these very often. Uh, most people don't wear them in the shower. We're talking about dive watches. No, I mean, these, these, even the modern watches today, it's, it's pretty funny. The Snow White, I dubbed the Snow White Daytona. I didn't even see what it went for. Between 800 and 1.2 went for 8.9. So basically 200,000 US dollars. Yeah, yeah. I think it's worth it. I, I really like these, these prototype examples. Prototype anything gets me interested. There's just something so special about the, the development that goes into making these. I say this time and time again. You look at like the Tudor P01. It's been dubbed such an ugly watch, but then all we see today is the beautiful finished product. And we don't ever get the opportunity to enjoy the stuff that built up to that finished product. And it's great to see what goes on in the minds of people when they're just tinkering in workshops. And this is the kind of thing that you would see sterile, no batons, no, no, not even a Swiss made printing on the base of the dial. And we never saw any of these sub dials without the, uh, the highlights around them. You know, this was like in the early days, just as we were, I love it. It's just, there's lots to take in. I see Junior is joining us. Welcome. Uh, and squiggly Frank says, this is real. It is for sure. It's real. They've got all the provenance papers. I guess there's a book written about it. I don't know, but then they've got the dial. They've got Singer stamped at the back. I guess Singer Dial was the manufacturer back then. And Masons join us. And I think I saw Design Atelier hop back in. Welcome. Okay, we're moving to row number two where I've highlighted 848 next. This is just a beautiful looking watch. I think worth looking at crossing off that number. Extremely rare. How many of these are there really? There are lots of these out there. Mechanically complex platinum tourbillon. Yeah. Great. We were chatting about that um, earlier example, the collab piece, and this is that typical arrangement that we know today. Between a mil and two mil was the expected win for 3.3. So that's like 340-ish thousand US dollars. Yeah. Truth fears, welcome. Great to have you here. And many more of you in the chat. Sorry that I'm missing you here. It's, uh, it's, it's difficult to run a ship and keep the presentation going while still talking. And now my nose is itching like crazy. Isn't that the best thing when you're trying to present something live and the hay fever is kicking in? Beautiful movement. Tourbillon, of course, we can enjoy deadbeat seconds. So there's, there's lots to take in. And the genre market is just climbing and climbing and the attention. Uh, kudos to this masterclass, as Designer Leah says. 
I love the fact it's similar to many other of these these special names out there that they they've come up with their own language. They've defined how these aesthetics will be done, and they're instantly recognizable today. Yeah, you don't even have to look at the name to know what this watch is, which is special. I mean, it's it's pretty, especially when you consider just the the sheer variety of watches out there today. It's pretty rare. I'm saying that that you can just determine the design of a watch and know exactly who it belongs to without even second guessing. I love it. Really nice. Okay, jumping to 850. We're doing good. We're on track. What's this? Grossman. Look at this thing. Another really nice example of a piece that deserves love. Fine, impressive, limited edition, white gold, Roman numerals, black anthracite lacquer dial. Look how clean it looks. And simple things like, I know Moritz Grossman likes to play around with the crowns. Circa 2020. Limited, this is number 8 of 25. I didn't know this was a limited edition. <laughs> Colombian coffee, Megan. Yes, that's it. You found my kryptonite. That's the way. That's how I can last through these shows. Um, I prefer Nicaraguan, though. Colombia, not as good as Nicaraguan. That's just uh, that's just what I've learned over time. Beautiful piece. The movements. Uh, this is typical of what we see from Ritz Grossman, too. The way that the arrangement is like that. I wish I knew more about movements. It's something, you know, the, the real academics out there, the Bill Sanders, those guys, they just, they know these things in and out. They can explain the complexity. I mean, he's a doctor of this stuff, so it, it makes a difference. I wish I had that kind of knowledge when it came to presenting. But still, I'm the aesthetic guy. I think that's the uh, that's what it's turned into. So enjoy the aesthetics. It looks like it has a semi-stepped lug arrangement, maybe. I'm not seeing that right. The hands, I mean, the one downside is I would say the hands are a little bit thin for, for a lot of eyes. I mean, you really have to squint. And if you're looking at this in the wrong light, I think the hands would disappear completely. But uh, yeah, <laughs> Mark's saying, is that a code word? No, I mean, she, she's meaning what she says. Uh, and Designer Studio says, I challenge everyone to show me a very slim hand. Like, they, they do it the best. I mean, that's their claim to fame, right? It's, it's pretty funny. Very difficult to read, unfortunately. I think this watch would probably be better done if the hands were white matching the, the Romans. But still. Um, I, th I believe they make the, sh the thinnest hands in the industry. That's like one of their, their call to go to signs. Okay. I'm going to jump next to 851. What is up next? This is fun because I don't even know what I've covered. Urban Jorgensen. Jorgensen. I'm sorry. Sorry to all my, my friends in that part of the world. Rare and attractive. Of course, you would expect it to be. Pink gold wristwatch. Now, what draws your eye to this thing at first? I think that the guilloche on the dial is one thing, but the lugs, the second thing. Seldom that you see pieces out there today that have these reverse teardrop lugs, scarab legs. I don't know how you would best uh, best describe it, but still 2018. This is not old. Uh, nine of 20 pieces, they, these were made. I think a couple of people out there would really enjoy this watch just for its diversity again in the description you can follow the link and it'll take you to these lots for you to enjoy as i'm talking around yeah the circle hand very yeah kovacs i agree the circle hand is it's it's the true like i think the reason why they did this is so that you can actually read the, the urban jorgensen on the dial that's a pretty nice touch <clears throat> you can see through it that's one of the elements that defines this piece does it work with the style arrangement though that's the question I guess in one way we can say it does stand out. It is an outlier in this. But then does it like complement the rest of the dial? I love the fact that they're applied Breguet numerals, stuff you just don't see very often. <laughs> uh, Truth says, I think I'm going to tell my lady to give me an Omega. I don't know what's going on in the chat. So many textures, that circle hand, I love that hour hand. It is really nice. I do enjoy it. I do enjoy it, yeah. Um, it's a two-way street. Yeah, I, I think guys are having a good laugh in the chat. Um, carrying on. So between 95 and 155 was the expected, and it went for 300. Wow. Yeah, beautiful. Really nice arrangement. And one thing, I think Megan pointed this out earlier, is that the uh, the prices for these watches, the sales prices, are all over the place. They really are all over the place. There's no consistency that we see here. So that's something to take in. Okay, moving to 857. Why am I doing that? Well, a lot of these watches, this is actually a good one to look at. Uh, this one being, like I think, the top seller, 9.3 it went for. What? We've seen a couple of these before, though. I'm pretty sure the Geneva auction covered this last time. It's not just a perpetual, but it's also a minute repeater, and it has all the jazz that you would enjoy. 36 mil diameter. 
great looking example, uh, reference 397R. And it's a 36 mil piece. This is something else. 1992, does it still have the Geneva seal? I can't tell. Maybe it does. A beautiful little micro rotor. I love how well arranged everything is. It's all centered there, which is nice. And the size is just something special, something to really take in. A leap year indication, all of that stuff. There's not as many Pateks, as far as I remember at least, not as many Pateks as we would expect. This is something that the Geneva show had so many of um, these classical dress watches. It looks like the Hong, again, I'll say this again, that the Hong Kong scene seems a lot more varied. They look at a wider variety of watches out there. I was going to say, I just simply would love that watch. Yeah, I agree, Megan. That that Jorgensen would be would be hers. Brown dial, rose gold. So if I just flick through these to, to lot 857, you'll see this is the reason why I've skipped some of these. Uh, De Beers, Jacob & Co. Jacob & Co. 2010 illuminated sand well that's that's good to enjoy uh we've got clocks and stuff yeah and then we have a jumbo of course and we jump to 857 now the reason why i wanted to focus on this unfortunately at this stage they only, i think they only covered 50 lots on today saturday which is so strange because they were half an hour late i guess they intersected with each other so unfortunately, we didn't get many watches sold, but there's so much. I mean, come tomorrow, they've got like 300 lots to cover. This being the uh, the last reference of the 36 mil before it was phased out. And I wanted to see what this watch would sell for at auction, just because of where the demand and interest is today. <laughs> Skip right over the jumbo. Yeah, watch and pray. I mean, I'm sick and tired of them. We see so many of them. Uh, I'm going to skip over a lot of these too. The reason why, again, I wanted to focus on this was just because I wanted to see its sale price. But they didn't even cover, what, 60 lots on day one, which is bizarre. Anyway, um, unfortunately, from now, we won't be able to see what these watches sold for. That's all happening tomorrow, Sunday. So now we're just flying by the seat of our pants, looking at the estimates and guessing what they might go for in the end. Still, I'm interested in seeing what the modern 36 holds. It looks pretty stunning. Uh, and this being that last reference, everyone is really clamoring for these pieces now, of course. Okay, jumping to 863. Let's have a look. 863, I need to take a hit from the whiskey or something next. I mean, how cool is this thing? Crossing that off the list. Um, Gerald Genta, beautiful little retrograde. And it's the Mickey Mouse watch that we all love and enjoy it's the watch that you wear to not be serious in life between 10 and 20 i think it's going to go for a lot more than that uh everyone uh, there's, there's quite a cult following for the genta mickey mouse watch as far as i know uh i love it skip right over the jumbo it's funny okay missing you in the chat uh, there's mention about uh kicking in the back and guilting me into this and that mark sorry i missed that in the chat i see carl has just joined us welcome yeah, we're going to have fun just chatting around these for a little while. Uh, and thank you all who are joining in and listening in. I hope you are enjoying your Saturday or Sunday morning, wherever you are in the world. See, this is just this is just cool. I mean, yeah, I think this will go way over the estimates. It's great that it has the original box that it comes in. The leather strap is superb. It matches the watch nicely. Disney co-branded. Whoa, that's a big deal. Circa 2000. And of course, this is the stuff that Genta was doing just as he was about to kick it. Uh, most of us know that Genta, like he, he started his own name brand under a lot of these pieces. So he was able to just have fun. And he's got some Breguet elements in there with the coin edge case, actually very Breguet with the lugs and all that stuff. Is that a, that's a pearl dial. I didn't even realize I noticed the texture and now I see it's actually a pearl dial arrangement. That is really cool. Yeah. Just fun. I mean, it's, this is what I like to see auctions that cover all the bases instead of just the stuff that People go mad for. Okay, I'm gonna hop to eight seven eight now. <laughs> That's quite a jump. I wonder why. Let's just have a look at one random one, like eight seven zero. That's why. Um, right, eight seven eight. <clears throat> I like this for the colors. I thought I thought it was time set to ten ten. V dev. Yeah, love it, love it. Uh, a lot of these watches, the the arrangements. Yeah, it's good. I just noticed that too. That 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 jumping hour. Um, okay, I, th I really like the color way of these pieces. There's a couple of offshores that I'm going to be missing, like the Rubens Barrichellos and those. We've seen lots of those before. I like the, the, the yellow versus the blue and how that worked. 47 pieces made to commemorate the 40th anniversary of Oceanographia. I don't know what that is, but uh, maybe the description will give us a bit more info. Hmm. 
this was sold in New York for anyone interested. Uh, so it's just an offshore. I think we've seen a lot of these before 2006. So this being right out of the gate after these were first, first brought out. A bit more of a modern take on what these look like now. Uh, okay, okay. So Megan mentioning that Gerald Genta pieces will be well sought after in many in the room. Hard to get. Mm. Many collectors will pay for this. Yeah, love it. And there's a couple. I think there's another Genta watch that we'll be seeing later. Uh, it's it's awesome. My fiance would love this. <laughs> uh, Pepe says, I don't understand Disney people. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the whole idea of... I mean, Mickey Mouse, we talk about icons of their time, design icons. Uh, you can't really go very far when you think Mickey Mouse, you know exactly who you're talking about. Same with the VW Beetle and all those definitive pieces. Uh, very rare and special. Is that what it says, Carrie? Oh, God. Attractive, rare and attractive. They're back on that bandwagon again. Okay, jumping to 885 next. Right. This is good. I'm feeling so much more at ease knowing that I now have like a, a sheet to follow. <laughs> makes my life a lot easier don't worry we still have at least a good hour and a half of the show to go there's there's a lot still to cover we haven't even reached the halfway mark yet i don't think um why did i actually avoided this watch i wasn't going to mention it but then i saw that it's platinum and it's a paris and it's a beautiful little santos it's so so nice this is going to go for a lot of money ah oh, man the Santos, you know, the original pilot watch, the original sports watch, the original wrist watch. It has so much to its history and its background. I think the size and everything works for it too. The smaller the size, the more it feels like this this watch that is, it packs, it has a, a bigger punch for what it is. You know what I mean? Uh, case form is beautiful. It's just, I especially love the fact that it's platinum. That just adds some some weight to it overall. Mark saying that I am rare and attractive. I am, yeah, for sure. I'm a rare and attractive limited edition person. Thank you, Mark. What about, um, what's another good? What about Uber Rare? I love it. Thanks for that, Mark. Yeah, got to say, these descriptions get irritating. I really wish they just bullet pointed it. I've said this so many times, but hey, I mean, what can you do? They have to sell these somehow. How can we not enjoy this piece? 27 mil in width, 36 mil in length. That is tiny. That is really tiny. I mean, they don't actually specify this as a ladies' watch. Thirty-six mils feels a lot smaller than than you would think. Between the, so circa nineteen nineties, I think this was one of the last of the you know the smaller sized models of the time. And of, uh, when it goes to platinum, I think these are some of the last platinum variants too out there. Oh, it's beautiful. And of course, saying Cartier Paris is another nice thing to add. Um, one of the requirements to wear Cartiers is carrying a purse. Oh, for sure. Truth fears. Uh, need more coffee. Megan, you need a ton more coffee. It's six in the morning. I don't know how you can be up watching this. It's just, it's a joy, but still, you're torturing yourself. <laughs> uh, given the square is shape, should wear like a 32 mil. It's going to wear small, very small. Another thing to, to factor in is the, the width of the case, the width of the bezel, and then the dial size itself. That all factors in. The watch is going to wear much, much smaller than you think. Just because of that so again unfortunately i mean even for even for a lady's wrist it is tiny today it is a really small size but i, I think the presentation is beautiful this is true to the original as well i think that's what they try to do with these actually is to recreate the original santos that was i think it was made in 1906 if i remember the history right and make it in platinum as this this commemorative machine okay i'm gonna hop to 901 and then as we are going Maybe we'll be, is that really what I'm doing? 901, 885, wow, that's quite a, that is quite a jump. Look at that. What am I missing here? Should we just flick through some? Triple eight. Ugh. That's why, okay, I'm going to jump to 893. That's why, okay, so 901 it is, I guess, uh, pre preamble and initial thought is a good thing. Love this case. I, I love the, the Breguet hands, the numerals. Doesn't need to say Patek on the dial to appreciate. It's it's a beautiful thing. Uh, one day maybe it'll be sold in an auction. Touristers, we're talking about. Um, but one day I will be sold in an auction. Touristers, you never know. You never know. Have my head in a glass jar. <laughs> I love it. Thanks, touristers, for that. Uh, reference five zero four zero. Many are liking these watches because they are not the ones that are sought after in this in this category, and that's something to pay attention to. This is an outlier piece for sure, but you're getting the full calendar arrangement, it's a perpetual calendar, full Breguet numerals, you get a micro rotor. I love it. Original box. 
I wonder if this this case is in good nick or not. 1992, it's a bit iffy, but yeah, yeah, love it. Really love that arrangement. Of course, yellow gold. It's got a cream white dial, so it has a bit more contrast to it. Uh, very dressy in its arrangement. And I think Carrie made a good a good point. I, I don't know if I missed it. I oh, was talking about about uh, purses, yeah, Cartiers and purses. Two case backs. Russell mentions. Hold on. Is that the case? They do. They have a solid and a clear. That's nice. It's nice to get some variety with your money. Between 118 and 195, I'm sure it will go in between that maybe. I still don't think these are very much sought after compared to their their rivals in this space. Um, you, and Chaz mentioning this will go above estimate. Okay, good points. Well, I, I think the one issue is that collectors seem to struggle with is the case. The actual form of the case doesn't speak to collectors as much as the circular stuff. And I guess that's one thing that, that pulls them in. 902 next. Let's have a look at this. Don't you, don't you think the variety is amazing on this? I, I must say, so one reason why I'm enjoying this more than anything is that we are seeing just all over the place. There's great stuff to see. Okay, so uh, uh, what are we looking at here? Lunga, 57, limited edition of 250 pieces, 2001. I, th I think I just love the fact that it's an open tourbillon and it's a Lunga 1 and there's a lot to take in. Beautiful arrangement for what it is. I don't know. This is actually a question I could pose to the audience. I don't know if this gets in the way of <clears throat> the cleanliness and that asymmetry that that the Lunga one is known for today. Uh, it's something I could actually pose to Russell because he loves his Lungas. Do you find that the Turbion cutaway like that is a bit jarring for what this watch is? It's supposed to be a very elegant looking piece. Does it feel like this evacuated hole looks like it was done as an afterthought in a way? I don't know. Something about tourbillons that I like is when they feel like they have been implemented and considered correct. Maybe it has to do. The reason why is that bridge. If that bridge was in, is that rose gold? If that bridge was in rose gold, I think that would make a big difference. Um, yeah, saber bridge is not my taste. So that's what they call it, saber bridge. Nah, makes sense. Does make sense. And then you have a sub dial here. This is amazing. A sub dial for your seconds. Yeah, looks good. Really, really good. Uh, Gold plus Patek plus 2021, insane, ridiculous money. Yeah, Chaz, I mean, I'm actually interested in knowing what that watch will go for. Maybe in the Hong Kong space, it'll go for more than in the, the Geneva space. But we have seen those models in the Geneva market, at least, not go for as much as, as we would expect. Still, really, really nice. Um, oh, Carl, you're talking about Audacity for audio leveling. I've been using Audacity for a long time. Before getting my microphone set up, that's what I use to adjust the bass and all of those those volumes and things. It's a really great program. If anyone's interested in, in audio recording and that, Audacity is a free to download software and it's it's very good. It's rated as like one of the top three best softwares that you can get out there. And the fact that it's free and it's easy to use, it takes a little time to get used to, but it's a great, great program. Um, so Pepe says, love tourbillons, love Lunga. This doesn't do it for me. Yeah, I still, I feel like that asymmetry breaks it up a bit too much. Okay, hopping to 903. You notice that within these selections, we have like a row of watches that all are good to talk about, and then suddenly there's this huge gap between them and the next selection. Okay, being a perpetual, this is beautiful. I love that large date at the top, 2005. I think many of us here would enjoy this watch just because of that symmetry. Day, date, complication, saxomatic. So I'm guessing it's got the small rotor. Ah, oh, it's so nice. It's just it's just gorgeous. 2005. I mean, these are, these watches are by no means new. It looks recent. It looks pretty relevant today, even though this watch is all of 15 plus years old. It still looks as good. Notice how they've done the uh, the date on the side here. That beautiful script quarter quarter markings on the sides there. Oh, it's, I think it's also the color that sings, the, the creamy off, off white and the, the yellow gold really speaks nicely. Has a zero reset function. Okay, that's even cooler. So when you pull out that crown, your second hand is going to jump to the 12 and, and hack the movement. That's really special. When you're wanting to synchronize time, not many watches do that. It's, it's actually quite an amazing complication that isn't spoken about a lot. Zero reset, worth looking at, ladies and gents. A bit heavy on the compression. <laughs> uh, don't know if we're talking about this. So we're talking about the earlier longer. No, thanks, that Eric and Junior. Thank you for the super chats. I hope you guys are enjoying it. Uh, I hope you're just uh, sitting back and listening to me ramble. I hope I don't put you to sleep. Um, yeah, 
it's good fun the layout reads beautifully it is it's it's just one of those things so nicely balanced and it's what perpetual longer always nails they they win at it all the time this one especially with the large date at the top is just so what longer does and don't you think it's one of the best arrangements for a date window i did that video a couple of weeks back about the best and worst the idea of having a date window that doesn't require magnification or any kind of cyclops lens it's just large for the sake it's now no longer just this tacked on feature it is a real accessory it feels like the watch was actually built around that feature too, which is something really good to take in that not many people notice. Um, Glasuso are just nailing it with, with their date windows on all accounts. Neil, thank you. Thank you for the super chat. I hope you are enjoying it too. Uh, <laughs> true fears. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this show was pretty spur of the moment, all things considered. I really did not expect to be doing one of these, but again, should I say, the last one we did was a month ago. Oh, you can see why I chose this. 904. Another yellow gold, this being an Oyster Perpetual. Why aren't they making solid yellow gold models from 1985? And you notice that it has a solid end link. That's something pretty interesting. We were transitioning out of that hollow end link phase, and now we have something that resembles a solid end link. It, I don't think it's fully there yet. It's still, they're still working out the kinks. You notice the spring bar has been implemented through the opening. That's so cool. How does that even work? I don't even know. That spring bar doesn't even look like it's attached. That is so strange. Anyway, lots to take in. Of course, this case has oxidized a little bit. 1985, pretty impressive. Yeah, love the condition. Why don't they make solid gold perpetuals today instead of just sticking to uh, the arrangement? And and Vega says, I prefer no date unless it's on an ALS. <laughs> Whenever I see ALS, a lung and zona, I think of Lou Gehrig's disease. <laughs> It's just what is it? amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, right? That's that's just the first thing that comes to mind. I know it's. I just whenever I think of lunga, I say lunga. ALS it gets my medical brain turned on. It's great, but I agree. I mean, of all watches, the, the Glasuto, the way they're doing their dates, the Glasuto Rigonals, lungas in general, they're just kicking, kicking serious ass. Turbo says the large double date at the six o'clock is a nice, excluding the Blanc, yeah, the, the, excluding the Blanc Pond fifty fathoms. Look up Glasuta Senator Observer. That to me, if I had the money, I'd get that watch tomorrow. Kid you not. Lung, uh, the Glasuta Senator Observer. Beautiful machine. Uh, Design Atelier geeking out. Yeah, for sure. That's what we do here. Uh, I, I love this. Again, yellow gold arrangements, I think, deserves a lot more praise. Sadly, you can't tell me this is a plated watch. Is it? Oh, it is. Oh, no. I didn't read the chat. I didn't read anything. I've just seen the description. It's electroplated. Oh, no. Okay. Well, that sucks. Right. Moving on then. <laughs> 905. Here I was thinking, I see the silver case back and I'm going, oh, dear. What? What was that about? Little did I know, 1985, rock and roll. Uh, think advanced life support. <laughs> Uh, and Mason says, uh, well, Lunga are using a pocket watch aesthetic. Yeah, so it's not really attached to the modern period. That's true. They are transitioning in this weird way. Uh, unfortunately, they're getting a lot more attention today, which kind of sucks. Bobby Lake says, I want the Geo 70s with the date. The 70s watch is definitely one of those on-the-fence pieces. You either love it or hate it. It's a, it's a peculiar – it's the television case model, right? Yeah, I like the 60s model with the, with the funky-looking numerals and, and dials. Okay, 2905 next. Unfortunately, this is electroplated, so that kind of ruins the value overall. Okay, going to hop on this quickly. Uh, let's see, 1969, yellow gold, gilt, black. I wanted to look at this just for the same reason as looking at the others. Nice presentation. 1969 we see I, I love looking at how the lugs were developed back then and you notice how they're like they, they kind of work they don't work this this approach had been had lasted for a long time i think over 40 years they had this idea of how the end link would attach with these two little hooks over the top it's a pretty efficient way of doing it actually considering uh surprisingly they didn't have drilled lugs on these models i wonder why and again what's amazing about it is the 1601 it's not a day date it is just your typical date just. And why we don't see solid gold date justs again, I'm hanging, hamming, hammering my hand down on why this is not happening. And I'm also obviously losing oxygen in this room. 
The sticker LO is dangerous. Oh, yeah, of course. Oh, Petri dish, man. Look at that thing. Russell, good shot there. Would you be safe? Would you feel safe putting that on your wrist? Oh, you don't know what's living in there. You know, it's 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 that. Yeah, that's funny. That's really funny. I love it. Thanks for that, Russell. Look at that crystal. Yeah, and how cool is it to see that that top hat? Yeah, there's something about acrylics. You just don't get that today. Unfortunately, I mean, what what I'm noticing, what we're seeing from from Rolex now is that they use these flat sapphires that protrude out of the cases. But then, sadly, they catch the light so much; they're very reflective. And that's something that the acrylics just never did. The, the light just shone right through them. And you can, I mean, especially this off angle axis, you can see right through it. With the modern variants though, the downside of those sapphire crystals without any kind of AR is that you're not getting it. Okay, beautiful. And I just love simple things like how the bezels were done back then. Everything was subtle. Even though this is solid yellow gold on a Jubilee, it's still subtle. Worth worth being looked at. After 1969, the watch models went nose down. <laughs> Truth be <laughs> I love it. Isn't that sticker? Mark says the sticker is awful. I think it's great, man. It just adds so much character to it. Ugh. Yeah, it's vile. I mean, peel that thing off, really. Is it necessary? Just put a clear sticker on the back. Don't, don't leave it on there. Okay, so we're going to hop to 906 next. Another vintage Rolex. Now, here we go. Another example of a 1675, but great nick. Re I think what, what, dra what drew me to it is the bezel insert and handset dial. Very neat. I think, <clears throat> I believe the hands have been replaced. Maybe. I can't really judge. It's a bit, it's a bit even all over the place, but uh, it's just very clean for what it is. 1966, Portuguese hallmark and guarantee. Okay. I'm guessing on the case back. I don't know. But I mean, this is really the archetype of its time. Don't you think this just defines what the GMT was about? Amazing. And we are going to see a um, earlier version. I think there is a Pussy Galore model later on. What's that? The 653, 6536 or something? I can never get it right. What's rare and unique and attractive kind? I'm betting 100 plus. The Ferry on Welcome. Uh, I don't. I don't even look at it anymore. It was a. It was a running gag that we had last year, I think, and now it's just excessive. Every single one. Every single example is rare. And I mean, I have said so many times they repeat it every single auction. It kind of negates the idea that these are collectible and rare if everything is rare, you know? Anyway, stunning. Between 200 and 300 is the estimates. And again, we spoke about this earlier. Everyone is just buying the name of these pieces. Uh, and Curtis says it took a full two years for the sticker on my 16750 to wear to a point that I removed it. Yeah. I mean, Curtis owned his from the get-go, 30 years, amazing. Pepe says 6542, thank you. Me and my reference numbers, yeah, I am the worst. I am the absolute worst. Still, great condition. I think the presentation is awesome. I mean, the, the actual sharpness of the case is there. This is the, this is the example that you seek if you're out there collecting these pieces. Awesome. Okay, hopping to 909 next. Uh, Megan says, beautiful, clean, 1675. I love that little soap. <laughs> it's so funny. Uh, with papers. Going to fetch a big number. So that's another thing. Has the authentic guarantee from back in the day. Isn't that amazing? 1966, and this watch still looks brand new. Hmm. Makes you question a lot of things. How rare are these watches actually, considering how many we see on a virtual daily basis? Anyway, jumping to 909 next. I don't know what I've missed, but these are all pretty good to look at. What did I miss from Chad? It says, love the colors of the vintage bezel on the Pepsi. Yeah, can't be duplicated any modern version. And there's just some, I mean, I did that video about bezel inserts, and there's just something about uh, aluminum next to, or aluminum to my American cousins, that just doesn't reflect, it doesn't refract. It's, it feels purposeful. It feels professional in a way. My belief is that these bezels were used because, like the crystals, they were expected to get damaged, so therefore easier to replace. And uh, that was just something that lasted for so long. These bezels were actually expected to get damaged because they were so cheap to replace in the, in the big scheme of things. Nowadays, we are seeing that ceramic is here to stay, and it's just so polished and shiny, and it can change the way the watch is viewed in many ways. Aluminium Pepsi is the best, is, is very nice. And of course, Neferion Bleach, Eric Bell also loves 
bleach. We love bleaching our bezels. And I haven't even spoken about this watch, Megan mentioning double red. Stunning. This being a Mark IV, I would imagine, right? Double red sea dweller. This is the one of the holy grails in this zone, for sure. 1975. I don't know if it comes with box and papers. Uh, it does have, I think this was still a patent pending back then. I don't know the full extent of my sea dweller history, but... And surprisingly, it doesn't have a domed crystal. Is this a replacement crystal? Oh, that is most definitely a replacement crystal. These are supposed to be domed, not top hats, which is why we don't see a Cyclops on these models. Huh, okay, that sucks. That's the first thing that I would do. I mean, you can't have a sea dweller without a domed bezel. That's like, that's blasphemy in this space, no? Still, great looking piece. I love the presence. I'm just, the condition of this watch again, it's outstanding. Does that mean then that the bezel has probably been replaced in its life? Maybe. Uh, the dial looks good. The hands could have been replaced too. They seem to have a slightly off color. <clears throat> and Turbo mentioning, it would be interesting what vintage values are in the future since Rolex has made millions of watches each year for decades. Yeah. Look, I, I think they're always going to be in high demand. Unfortunately, it's the name that sells. It's no longer really the, you're not getting the value out of the design anymore. It's the name. It's all to do with the name. And as long as it says Rolex on it, you're going to fetch money for them. That won't, I think in 100 years' time, that won't change. Even the modern things, who the hell knows what's going to happen for the modern watches especially? Where is that going to change? What, I mean, what's the deal? Still, beautiful condition, stunning, stunning model. <laughs> That's parts for assembly. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have the domed crystal, which is what I love about the Sea Dwellers. They had these ridiculous dome arrangements. Surely it can't be that difficult to find uh, an original domed bezel for these models too. Megan says it's a beauty going to sell for a fortune. I'm sure it will. Uh, seldom that you see one in such such good condition. Yeah, that's great. Jump in two nine one zero, probably another Rolex. Do you see what I mean about how there's like a, a list of five or six Rolexes, and then there's just fluff, and then there's another great selection of others. And I've noticed the Flip and Zippo's joined in. Welcome, Flippin. Great to have you. Um, yeah, the colors were made for Pan American. They were Pan Am, Justin. And talk about having just a great opportunity to make a watch. I mean, they just brought out the sub. The GMT was a no-brainer. Just slap on a, a different colored bezel, add another hand, and you've got this crazy cool complication. Okay, so 1680. This one in not the same level of condition that we've just seen, which is quite interesting. Uh, I think that's why I focused on it. This being a red Submariner, also one of the most sought after here. The first, I believe the first date Submariner ever produced, 1970. This being the, um, oh, what's his name? All, all Good, all, uh, what's, what's the show called now? All Good Men? No. <laughs> all, the, all the King's Men? What was that? Um, tell you what, oxygen deprivation, 101 minutes in. Beautiful though. Still, I, I love these. If, if when it comes to having a date Submariner, it's, isn't it funny how the modern watch just doesn't portray the same thing? I mean, the only red, we have a red Sea Dweller 43 now that is pretty much trying to jump on this, this arrangement with the Cyclops and all that stuff. But having just an accent color, why don't more watches have accent colors at the base of their dials? Yeah, Mason, it has been polished. That is for sure. Chamfering. The facets have all disappeared, unfortunately. This one has been worn in its life. Still, I mean, you look on the underside, it is pretty sharp, all things considered. Uh, between 115 and 195 is the estimate. Yeah. Red sub, still very rare and attractive. Of course, they say fine and rare. Yeah, that's the way it goes. 914. Jeez, I haven't been drinking very much during the show. It's crazy. So... Jump into a reference 96. The reason why I did this, nostalgia. Good to enjoy the nostalgia trip on some of these models. Uh, this being the original Calatrava from 1941, wouldn't you believe? Uh, yeah, great looking example. Have I crossed out this? No, on the list. There are a couple of other Pateks that were listed previously, but I don't think any stood out as much as this. The awesome thing about this model especially is that it has loomed numerals, which is something you don't see at all. Can you believe the size though? 30 millimeters in diameter. 30 millimeters. Case back. I uh, do not know what that means. I guess it's an insignia for a company. Uh, do not know. 1941. A lot was going on in the world back then. So it's another good thing to point out, by the way, is I actually really like this history, is that 
back then, when the world was you know, topsy turvy, <laughs> uh, Patek released some of the most amazing complications for their watches. And that's something that's lasted the test of time. And we're seeing that. I mean, they were making perpetuals, they were making perpetual chronos, the full range. And even then, I mean, this this has a very militaristic looking arrangement. You could you could slap this in a stainless steel case and swear it's a it's a service watch. It looks like a, a field watch. So something to take in. 1941, maybe the officer who wore this had uh, had intentions of using it as a field watch, which is pretty nuts. I just I love the fact that this being the reference 96, it has numerals instead of batons, the typical cliche arrangement. I thought it's uh, worth looking at. 30.5 mils, though. That's insane. That is so small. 30.5. Times have changed, hey? Times really have changed. And this watch in 36 today is still considered small, but 30 millimeters. It's actually quite hard to fathom the size of that. Basically, get a 36 millimeter watch. The size of the crystal <clears throat> is the size of the whole watch that you're looking at. Mind blow. Okay, jumping to 916. Let's have a look. What's next? Uh, you can probably see why I chose this one. Those reverse numerals that follow the, the dimension of the dial. I love that. Very seldom you see it. And surprisingly, you'd expect this kind of arrangement to be in and around the 1940s as well. But this is 1966. <laughs> Koji says I could wear it. Yeah, I'm sure I'm sure we would uh, compromise and wear a 30 mil Patek given the chance. And Burbing Heart is saying, nope. The only reason why I chose this one, I think, is just because those those numerals around the dial really do add a little bit of character. Also notice the, the lugs. Would you call them corn de vache? Corn de vachean transitional to that late 60s period where we were getting a bit more jagged, a bit more sharp. It's not as organic anymore. That's something to take in. Uh, yeah, nice looking piece. What's the size? 35 millimeters. Okay, we're moving up. Still. Same kind of reference, same subdial arrangement that we would expect. These lugs definitely date the watch, though. Look at that crystal. Isn't that cool? That's a fully domed acrylic certificate of origin, which is nice. And they call these spider lugs. Okay, I've learned something new. Cat ear lugs. Yeah, that sounds better, burbing hard. Really nice, though. Really nice piece. I'm going to jump to 918. I'm liking the fact that we're actually being consistent. And the beauty is that if someone wants to throw in a suggestion of a watch to look at, we can do that. At a later stage for sure i liked excuse hit the mic there i like this piece uh, i think there was actually talk about this watch at one stage early on that these are not getting the attention they deserve and i mean look how simple it is reminds us of that i think it was a roman gautier that we saw earlier that looks just like this 1946 okay 33 mil diameter i mean can you believe it a chronograph of this size 33 mils it's a mind blow isn't it great that you also see all of these archive extracts with them? It's, it adds a nice touch to the arrangement. It's, it's, just, it's just awesome to think of this time. I don't know. Did they have a movement shot? Why wouldn't they show us a movement of these? Why, why wouldn't they show us a movement photograph of these pieces? I don't know. 1946, and they were making these kinds of things. I love that balance. It's, it's definitely, it's, it's not so much a watch that looks as you know, modern today as we would expect. It does look kind of old fashioned with the hobnails and all of that there. But then again, it also does still look you know, a watch of its time. It, ca it captures, who could through there? Captures it pretty well. More coffee to the brain. I'm obviously mincing my words. 33 mil diameter, insane. Too small with the subdials. Can you imagine how hard it must be to read? Yeah, I agree. Fully agree. Jumping to 924. Okay, what am I missing? Let's jump to 922. What do we see? That's why we're jumping to 924. It's good to make a list. It helps. It helps my sanity. I actually can check off these things as we go. Now, why did I choose the release not done? Well, not difficult to see. Number 10 of 10. Russell, I think this would definitely get your attention. This being a cloisonne arrangement. I would imagine Venice, yep, Venezia, 10 out of 10, platinum, it says at the base of the dial. I love that. That is so cool. We're going to see a couple of those in a second, actually, uh, a couple of models that have all been hand-painted. Uh, San Marco, Ugh, it's so nice. I really like it. The stepped, the stepped lugs do age the watch a little bit, but it's that dial that you're really hunting for at the end of the day. Uh, and, you know, we think of the story of how these are made and the process and the, the pain that it takes to make these. 1996, 37 mil in diameter. 
It's actually a really good size for a time only. Uh, and Neferion says, great deals with UN. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, Russell, I don't know if you'd like me to share this, Russell, but as a collector, you began with about 12 UNs and then one day just decided to sell the lot, keep one or two <laughs> and sell the rest and then jump to you know brands like Patek and, and the rest. But as far as on the gray market, there are some amazing deals you can find with these for sure. Shame they haven't numbered the front. That's something, Russell, to point out. Yeah, it is a bit unfortunate. You don't want to see that every time you look at the watch. It's kind of uh, it's kind of tacky. But oh, you kept three. Okay, so you had twelve, and I think it was like that. Had twelve and kept three. Really beautiful though, and the the way they've done the sky and everything. It's maybe it's I don't know if that was the original color or if it's just aged in sunlight. But I think it also just adds in. And it says that you and anchor needed the boat, needed in the boat. <clears throat> you know what? It would be better if they actually had the anchor at the base. It would make more sense considering that it's a boat, but even though gondolas don't uh, don't need them. Right, jumping across to 926, and I think we're going to see another set of cloisonne arrangements. Oh, no. I chose this just because who doesn't like a beautiful classic Breguet? 7027. Can you believe this is 2006? They're still making these today, I believe. Uh, 37 millimeter in diameter is pretty amazing. Uh, excuse me for a second. I'll tell you what, there are stages when I run out of breath, I have to catch up. 7027, semi skeletonized wristwatch, power reserve certificate, presentation box. Yeah, it looks awesome. It's funny to think that they're still making them exactly the same today. And it has all the hallmarks. How can you not like that traditional arrangement of you've got the huge, I mean, that's your mainspring right in the center. So you can enjoy seeing that as you're winding. Uh, you have the balance on one side. You've got all the gears to maintain it. You've got your power reserve up there. I think the best thing about a skeleton dial is when it's done, we wouldn't call this a skeleton, would we? It's how you get to see the full, the beauty about this especially, you get to see the full arrangement of the movement in the front with everything else. You don't have to turn the watch around. There's there's like nothing really to see. <laughs> I mean, look at that. There's nothing really to take in at the back compared to the front. But the one downside, I guess, is the color. This this would look much more appealing in platinum or in white gold. This in, in yellow is a little bit too, dare I, garish, should we say. Uh, it's not rare. I mean, oh, that's, that's funny. They don't mention that. So how's that? I would consider this rare next to the lot of the other watches we see. It's funny. But uh, Koji says they still make this reference. Pretty amazing. 2006. What's that now? How many years later? Um, 14, 15 years later, still going. Beautiful. Really, really nice. I think it's worth, I, I believe they make them bigger now. They, they come in 40 mils instead of 37. Still, ah, Brigger. It's one of, those, one of those brands that I think will always be a grail watch brand for me. I love the history. I think their designs are just so unique. That's really why, why I jump on these, especially. Uh, these models just feel so true to how they were established. They just they just work in every way. Jumping to 929, another, this being a 165024. Look at that dial and just take it all in. That is what you call like perfect patina. Is there such a thing? I think the vintage collectors in the audience would agree that that is just exceptional. I mean, like how this being the, the first gen of the 165024, the next one we would see would have the large triangle. This being just after the transitional models, the what is it, the 165014, uh, uh, which is like the, the early 60s model, and then this being the first professional. Yeah. Out of all the lots, I think this is the one that I would probably take. Um, considering what it is and how well it's done, I just, it's so beautifully arranged there. It come, don't tell me that's an original box. Oh, if that is the original box that it came with, that's amazing. Um, so yeah, December 22nd, 1996, Argentina, it was bought in. Just so cool. I'm going to be, I could just sit and gush over these, this, this model, especially for ages and ages. There's just too much to take in. As far as that, just, Excellent. I believe, I mean, this is just how I feel. Is that I believe it to be one of, if not the top three best dive watches ever made. This is just how it should be done. Uh, Chaz, thank you so much. Are you are you actually driving again? You tend to be on the road a lot on the weekends. Uh, Chaz, thank you for the super chat. These these are good fun. I wouldn't be doing them if I didn't want to. These are always just great to sit back and, and to ramble. 
uh, don't cry for me, Argentina, too clear. That's funny. Uh, and Toba says, you really love these sea masters. Your voice and tone changes. Just, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a funny thing. It's just this love affair that I have with them. I thought, like, we just talk about, like, the typeface on these dials. There's nothing superfluous on it. Omega Automatic Seamaster. No rubbish about it being a perpetual movement and all this stuff and just essays and too much script. They don't even need to specify the depth rating because it says Seamaster 300 there. So you can guess that it is a 300 meter rated watch. Even though, yeah, I can talk about this for ages. Great condition too. Uh, this, I hope this goes for a lot of money. Look at the estimate. Look how low they estimate these things. Between 46 and 95. Yeah, sadly. Okay, jumping to 930. What next? Another Speedy Pro, this being with a applied, there's an applied logo, 145. So this having 1968, this does have the 321, I believe, the last of the last with the 321s, I believe. Correct me there. <laughs> and the friend says they should make this, but without Fotina. Yeah, I mean, sadly, they're in the stage now where the Fotina dial is something that works. I think for relative to the watch's age, it, it has earned its stripes, even in the reissue category. I think some models can get that for the sake of it. Notice how this, I don't know why the page seems to zoom out and stuff at times. I'm going to try and like center it a bit better for everyone. Sorry about that. I mean, these are great. We had a look at an earlier model, but I believe someone might need to help me that I believe this is the last of the 321 just before they went to the 861 caliber. So pretty special. The last of the last. It's nice. And being an applied Omega logo is one of those things that tells you it's it's a gem. Yeah. So uh, so many came in Goldsmith boxes. Oh, really? They did them? Oh, okay. Thanks, Eric. So a lot of the originals came in Goldsmith boxes back in the day. We're talking about the, the original MOD models. Um, love the sub dials. There's a couple of like little quirks these did, like the way they were stepped. I think the Speedmaster script is slightly different. Of course, the case has changed. Oh, sorry, I say the dial has changed a bit. Um, and isn't it cool to see how these modern ones are being received? I would love to experience the uh, the latest the latest reissue. I shouldn't say the latest take on the the eighties variant of the Speedmaster Professional has just come out. Those the bracelet and everything there. Um, had some pretty cool owners' testimonials on how good the modern Speedmaster is now. Uh, talking about accuracy, I mean, this guy has had the watch on the wrist for a month, and it's still within like a tenth of a second. That's how sharp it is, timekeeping-wise. Pretty amazing. You've now got a coaxial automatic. That's no, not automatic. Coaxial column wheel chrono. No, it's, not, it's a cam wheel. Oh, what am I saying? I'm really losing it, huh? Uh, I'm really loving their coaxial movement that they've incorporated into the chrono. Okay, next up, 931. What's not to like about this? You can see, I mean, you don't even have to look at the watch. You can see it's a piece out of the 70s. 1969, the last of the last. Is this a world time complicate? Is this a world time bezel it's got on it? That is so weird. Okay, uh, why would they do that? So it's a reference E2643 for anyone who wants to know. <laughs> uh, has an original case it looks like it comes in and these are the kinds of pieces again that we can really enjoy sit back and enjoy because they're just so perplexing and peculiar this is what we would expect i mean this case design you'll actually notice was used with examples like the, the type 20s from this era um, i went out of my way to feature a dodan in that french military video which had a very similar case in around the 70s um, isn't it cool Beautiful. I mean, the patina is great. The bezel looks so busy. I mean, this gives the, the Navitimer a run for its money. <laughs> it's a mess. I mean, how do you even use the thing? Uh, but still, I still don't even understand the reason. I mean, it's it's just a it's considered a diver's chronograph. Okay, that's how they that's how they're listing it at least. Diver's chronograph with a tachymeter and a world time. So so while you're in the water, it's like, okay, let's time the dive. And then let's also see what time it is in Baghdad at the moment. It's like, what? <laughs> that's so weird. Uh, anyway, uh, that's just how they do it. Also just love the original uh, Lacoutre hand script there. And what a crazy, weird bezel. Why did they do that? I guess they were just trying to sell watches back then. They didn't really care about if it made sense. I mean, that's the 70s for you. Right, jumping to 932. What else do we have? I love these vintage. There's a handful of these. Look at that thing. Wow, that is awesome. Enercar, 1968. This thing looks brand spanking new. For once, I can agree with you, Phillips. Well-preserved, yes. Look at that thing, the jet graph. 
and notice things like this looks like a yeah, I don't know if anyone is is uh, accustomed to knowing Bino Bino comics, but the black and white arrangement there for that hand very Bino esque, which was a comic strip I think based in the UK if I'm not wrong, maybe that's Dennis the Menace you know all of that from back in the day. Uh, nice type twenty I saw yesterday at a preview really Megan oh type twenties. I, they, they deserve so much love. They're just beautiful. So this thing, I mean, you see the bezel on this example, a GMT bezel. It reminds us of, what is it now? The, the 2254. I think it's a 2256, which is the GMT model of the, the Seamaster where they have this steel looking uh, finish on both sides. Yeah, it's it's crazy. It's so quirky. So the way this works, I don't I don't know if this this red element is actually in sync with the bezel or if it's if it's separate. But that's how you can judge your time zones. So again, you've got this chronograph that has a time zone complication to it. It's an excellent condition. They're just, I mean, look at this. They've got a, it looks like an oyster with a, with a pearl inside it there and just funky stuff of its time. 24-hour rotating bezel, red pointer ring, but it's a chronograph. A chronograph GMT. So damn weird. Okay, coffee again. Any car washes are perfect. I mean, uh, there's... It's crazy how much the attention has jumped on them lately, actually. Like the Sherpas and those models, it's insane. Their prices are really climbing, sadly. Uh, I think they deserve it, but still. This one should be picked up by those collectors out there. I think the condition is exceptional. I love it. Look how well the, the Luma's aged. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about. These these outliers, again, you wouldn't see this kind of watch in the, in the Geneva auction. Hong Kong, on the other hand. They're like experimenting. They're like testing. Uh, Blue Shirt saying, hopefully one day I can add a Type 20. You know what's funny, Blue Shirt? Um, a viewer actually was commenting on, just as I, I dropped the uh, the Philip, the French military video um, on Thursday, so a viewer said, I'm waiting for the delivery truck because I have a Type 20 on its way. So he was able to sit back and enjoy the video while waiting for his watch to arrive. I thought that was great. Uh, but yeah, the Type 20s are just amazing. Again, watch history check out his channel. He has such a knowledge on these pieces and very he deserves a lot more views, put it that way. Okay, jumping to 933, beautiful inner car. This is also one of my favorites, I think. I would easily pick up one of those. Now, why did I focus on this? We see the Nautiluses crop up everywhere, but for me, this is my favorite complication thrown into a Nautilus. If I had the opportunity of owning one, I think this would be the model that I would go for. I love the annual calendar arrangement. It's very Patek in the way it's done. I also think the leather strap adds a bit more dynamism to it. Could be rubber for all I know. But there's there's something about how it has this dress sport feel that is quite conflicting in a way. Fun though. Fun to look at. And Farron is already saying <laughs> no thanks. Truth Fear says PP equals no, no. <laughs> I uh, love you guys. This is so good. Uh, Curtis says, I love the Anycar logo and script for me as a pilot. The Chrono GMT is a perfect combination. I mean, good point. Good, Very good point, Curtis. And there's just something about those logos of the 50s. They were just trying anything and everything with their arrangements. Sadly, that creativity has just disappeared over time. Uh, favorite comp is a moon phase, Justin said. Unfortunately, you can't get this complication without the moon phase. If, if given the choice... I would want to chuck this whole subdial. I don't want. I don't want to know the twenty-four hour time or the moon phase. I just want the day, date, month, and that's it. But sadly, they don't do that complication. So this, you have to compromise by having this big open mouth in the middle of the dial. But I love how centered it is. Of course, you can just the design aesthetics. You can just see how well balanced it is there. Nice arrangement. Like, yeah, <laughs> I often listen to Moon River, so don't care for Moon Phase. That's funny. Thanks, Truth Fears. Yeah, nice looking watch. We've chatted about the Nautiluses so much. And I jump from 933 to 942 next. Let's just have a look at an example of, I don't know, 939. What's that? Yeah, I mean, we've seen so many of these. Uh, again, it's, it's a hobnail. Okay, we call it a Calatrava Perpetual. Yeah, we've chatted about these watches so often in the past. I'm thinking... Instead, let's look at something that's a bit more eye-catching, like Salmon Dial. Now, this is not, I think of all the models, the Salmon Dial is the, is the hardest to get in this category. It's not for everyone. This was their first annual calendar they ever did. Correct me if I'm wrong. There's something special about this. I think it's their first annual calendar that they did under the Patek seal. 
uh, a bit iffy. There's something special about this watch. Someone correct me. But there's something very charming about a salmon dial. Not for everyone. Again, the arrangement is a bit funny, a bit funky looking. But then again, pretty nice. Richard, thank you. <laughs> One for the enthusiast. Thank you, Richard. Uh, that, that looks like a two-tone Explorer that you're wearing right there. I think I can't judge by the avatar, but wow. Uh, thank you so much for the super chat. Yeah. I mean, these, these shows are great. I'm surprised that others don't cover the Phillips auctions, but there is, there's something nice to just sit back and enjoy what is on offer. I love seeing the divide between Geneva and Hong Kong, especially seeing that difference between the pieces there. Yes. Salmon dial, salmon Islander on the way. Oh, awesome. Well done to Ferion. Uh, the white date window. Not sure about that, Mark. I mean, that's the downside. Patek just doesn't, I don't think they have any models. It's maybe one or two examples that have black date windows, but the rest are all white and they stand out so much. It's unfortunate. If they had a matching date window, it, ch it would change the watch completely. I mean, the overall arrangement of this isn't the easiest to read. Uh, we notice another cool thing is that they actually have a true eight on the dial. Of course, my mouse doesn't cooperate with me, but you can see that the eight is not a watchmaker's eight. It's the full, hold on. I'm talking about watchmakers four. The eight is fully expressed, which is something quite nice. There's there's interesting allocation of space. <laughs> you notice how much there is printed on this side next to this side, which is sparse in comparison. It's a bit weird. Squint your eyes and have a look. The, the last, the, the third quarter of the dial is very occupied where the rest of it seems very open. You know, 1997, the 90s were a, a weird time. Okay, jump into 944. What's next? I love the salmon dial. I think that's why I chose it. This thing is cool. This is definitely a nope watch for a lot of people out there. <laughs> Lots are going to say this is the most hideous thing. I believe it's nicknamed the octopus. And I think Russell actually gave me that as a, as a point there, saying uh, because we have eight legs to this Um <laughs> yes, that, that's it. Four verse four, Carl. That's it. Exactly. Uh, this salmon islander sounds like a fishing spot, Justin. That's so funny. And Megan's talking about salmon sandwiches at high tea. I've never, can't say I've ever had that before. <laughs> Maybe I have. I don't know. Salmon. Are you talking like raw salmon? I can get behind that. That sounds good. Smoked salmon. Okay. So extremely, I mean, look at this description. You've got to laugh. Extremely rare and technically impressive platinum dual time yeah whatever i i like this because it it speaks to that pilot calatrava that we know uh but then it also has the, the function of an alarm built in as as russell mentioning alarm piece uh it's just so funny that it's it's called the octopus it's so so weird seeing how it's been done it looks like a vulcan cricket don't the vulcan crickets have a similar arrangement to this with their big ears that stick out there yeah it's not a watch for everyone but I do enjoy the balance on this, even though it is so perplexing. I don't even know how, I mean, what is the pull-out crown? I don't even know where that is. How do you set the time and stuff? Do all these pushes, you know, I, it's weird. So it's 24-hour time. It's it's basically a travel time with a built-in alarm. And that's very nice. I mean, you can you can judge. It's quite difficult to see, but you can judge whether the alarm is engaged or not by that little white dot there on the dial. I wish that text would disappear on the screen. Just bear with me. Uh, looks good. And of course, you have the travel time. You have your date at the base, which is interesting. Uh, so many pushes. I know. It's like, it's just, it's just, you know, it's that, what, man toy. You know, it's that thing that you just enjoy for the sake of boys' toys, I should say. <laughs> Alien, for sure. I'll, I'll, good having you here. Um, and Rick's saying, will this PP alarm go for above or below retail? Uh, you know, this is from 2020. I didn't know they still make these. I thought they made them in a limited run. Correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, it's, a, it's a great, weird, one of the strangest watches they make at the moment. Those four, <laughs> those four pushes would drive me nuts, Megan says. We'd get caught on everything. I know, right? I know. I mean, that's something that we don't talk about very often is the struggle when it comes to pushes getting hung up on jerseys. And I str it's the worst. I get it all the time, too. And whenever you have a big crown, it manages to just get snagged on stuff. Yeah. So you don't have any advantage wearing this on the left or right wrist because you're going to have pushes going into your hand regardless. So uh, enjoy. I sure enjoy my man toy, flip and zipper. Should I say boy's toy? There we go. Sounds a bit better, right? Uh, and Richard says that is a two-tone explorer. Thank you for the super chat. So you've just picked up the new 36. 
It's great, man. Congratulations. Uh, there's a few other here, a few others here who also have one, and they're loving it. It's going to be a very interesting watch. I'm looking forward to seeing where that watch goes and where the interest lies with it, because it does like we think of the two tone Sea Dweller and the two tone Sub and how that's become a classic from the 80s. You think where that's going to be in the next. You know, think of where the Explorer is going to be in the next 20 years, say. Where is that attention going to be? Uh, Turbo is leaving us dinner time. Good luck. Enjoy yourself. Uh, we're going to have some fun carrying on with this. We don't have – how many more do we have to go? So we've just finished row number two. We've got, we've got like one and a half more rows left. It's pretty good. We're about halfway. It's pretty nice. Um, Turbo, thank you for joining in. It's always a pleasure. Next time, we will be doing wrist shot week in the next two weeks. So that should be good. Uh, Truth Fears says, Nefero and I lost interest in Rolex a long time ago. And Justin says, the, the palm dial, the new definition of the tropical dial. It's a little bit on the nose, don't you think? Megan says, what the hell is that JLC? I actually, t I turned your dad onto this. It's the, the Amvox. I think it's the Amivox. Made in partnership with Aston Martin. Okay, And one of the cool traits about it, I don't know if this one has it, but the chrono version you don't have any pushers. You actually use the crystal to, to use the chronograph. Amazing watchmaking. Uh, the reason why I focused on it is because the Amnivox, is it, what is it called? The Amnivox or Amnivox? Surely it should say it somewhere. No? Where is it? They don't actually mention, you see in all this fluff, they don't mention what this watch is. Uh, let's see. There it is. Amvox. Good. Helps if they actually explain that in the description. Amvox. It's a cool looking watch. It's It's like, <clears throat> reminds me of a, a Hublot. It's like a Hublot love child with Zenith and JLC all in one package, only made in partnership with Aston Martin. They have a little logo at the bottom there. This one, I think, just has a GMT and a, that's about it, huh? GMT, complication, and a second time zone. Okay. And the date. Okay, got it, got it. So the date hand runs across. It's got a pointed date. It's a very strange, peculiar-looking machine, but I think uh, <laughs> does it break down all the time and share forward spare parts? I think it does, Eric. I'm sure it does. I mean, it's JLC, and remember, this is they're, they're they're serious watchmakers. So it's nice to see that they test this conceptual stuff. I think only JLC could pull off a machine like this. Definitely not for everyone. I mean, it gets negative points in the legibility space the legibility scheme of things. <laughs> most most confusing GMT ever. That's it. Lasso, you got it on the nose. Is that, is that Lasse? Got it on the nose there. Most illegible too. Um, I like the fact that this made Megan like double take and say, what the hell is this watch? It's great. The JLC Vantage. Hmm. Disadvantage, I would say, Justin. Uh, all things considered. We're thinking about legibility and all that stuff. Jumping to 948. Next. This thing is awesome. I think there are a couple in the chat that would really enjoy this watch. Some could maybe call this like an, an aliexpress special by the way the dial's been arranged but then look at that perpetual calendar tourbillon 234 to 390 is expected price i believe these were very small batch made um i just like it because it's a jlc it's not the typical jlc we it's not the typical jlc we see very often uh tongue twisters gotta love it that's better russell says talking about this looks good does look good. To be on perpetual calendar, we have the, the year in the center there, which is nice, well balanced. I think what breaks it up for me are these, as you mentioned earlier, saber elements, and I can see how they've the, the evacuated parts there look a bit odd. Movement is beautiful. Look at that rotor, Gillesche on the rotor and all of that there. Circa 2010, between 234 and 390 is the expected price that it's going to go for. Who knows? Definitely not for everyone. It looks a little bit, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, it just doesn't feel like a JLC. That's the downside. <clears throat> we, we've come to this point where we can identify a JLC pretty easily by how their dials are done, and this doesn't speak to that very much. Notice the batons. That's pretty much a giveaway. Other than that, weird. <laughs> Disadvantage, George. Yeah, I thought that one up on the fly. How about that? Um, wouldn't have thought this was a JLC at first glance. Yeah, unfortunately, that's the downside to these. It doesn't really look like one. Uh, worth worth looking at, though. Has Hans joined us? Welcome, Hans. Good to have you here. Right, jump into 950. We're doing pretty well. This will be a shorter show than expected. This is good. I mean, it, it gives me a bit more confidence to know that I can talk around these things and not lose track of time. 
We've been running the show now for two and two hours, 15 minutes. Wow. This could be just over three hours long, the show. How is that? Gee, that's like, that's a record. I can actually sit back and drink some whiskey and read the chat for a bit. <clears throat> All right. I just whacked the whiskey glass in my glasses. Right on. So, disadvantage. Oh, that's funny. Next. Megan, you're being very unkind. This is better. What makes this watch cool? Uh, why I like it. And this is as far as I know. They're the, at, the, at this point in time, they're the only ones that make a double moon phase in this arrangement, which is really cool. This is not a big pilot, though. This is what they would call a Portuguese, right? I don't know. They don't specify that in the description, so I have to look somewhere else. Is this a Portuguese? Uh, don't know. Probably. Yes. I mean, looking at that power reserve, I think it must be. Anyway, fine and attractive. Yeah, yeah. Perpetual calendar, seven day power reserve. Of course, they're known with their big cases. They are. Uh, they're known to have their power reserves. Uh, Hans is expecting it at 12.57. No, I think we're going to go over that time. You might want to bump it to maybe one. I would say 110, maybe roughly, Hans. Uh, Eric says nailed it. You guys are the worst. So this watch is great. Does this actually have a tourbillon in it? Hold on a sec. I don't think it does. But as far the moon phase complication is pretty interesting because it looks at the north and the southern hemispheres. I don't know if you can see that very well, but the northern is indicated there. The southern is there. So you can actually see what's going on both sides of the world, which is a nice arrangement. The Ferion is predicting 113, as in uh, 13 minutes past one. Megan says, sorry, I don't like this IWC dial out, badly designed. <clears throat> There's a lot going on. And I didn't even notice this. The only thing that caught my attention was that, but this is a bit peculiar, how we have a solid window here and a semi-skeletonized element here for the days and the dates. Uh, it is a bit much. I kind of like how this window has been done, though, where you have seven days a week. It's actually a retrograde with it jumps across, and then you have the month arrangement there. That's very neat. Um, so they do also make a big pilot in this configuration, too. 44 mil, so it is semi-legible considering what you're seeing. Uh, other than that, no thank you, JLC, Truth Fear says. That's funny. Uh, it is very busy, though. And it's not what we would come to know from IWC. I mean, they, they're very big on their legibility. They need to stick to their pilot pieces. It's good to see, though. I, I especially like the idea of the um, the moon phases. Okay, two next, jumping to 954. What is that? Oh, this thing is so fun. This made the cover photo because it's just, it's it's kind of a designer's dream in a way. We talk all about the Royal Oaks and it's been spoken about to death, but I think the concept is just one of those that deserves some love. It's pretty amazing to think that the designer was able to take the, the established formula of that Genta aesthetic and move it into a modern phase by adjusting how the case has been done with these, pris what we call them, prismatic faceted edges. I love it. It's just so, it feels, it's still at this point, it still feels like a watch design from the 70s. But I mean, it also just has this futuristic feel to it as well. It looks great. 44 mils, pretty good size. Probably wear like a 46, considering how the case has been done. Attractive, rare, and oversized. <clears throat> okay. I mean, it'd be great if they gave me more indication. Titanium, dual time, flying tourbillon. There's lots of stuff. So let's just try and make sense of the dial. Uh, as far as I know, this little pusher at the base, oh my gosh, this mouse, this little pusher at the base of the dial here uh, lets you adjust your setting of time, your setting of date, and your setting of something else. Can't remember. There's So that's the neutral, and where it is now, the N is the neutral position. I really like that. The, it's it's something about how it has this, it has a very skeletonized feel to it, but it's also fairly legible for what you're seeing. Um, Stealth Fighter, good point, Justin. Yeah. Does look, does look like a U2 or a um, SR70, SR71, huh? AP Brutalicious, Forbin, I would agree, for sure. I've never cared for this watch at all, Dabby says. Look, I mean, my, my argument is that it's it's much more exciting than just another typical Royal Oak. I think it's good to see this, <clears throat> this push. Being called the concept watch, it fulfills that quota quite pretty well. And uh, also considering that <clears throat> when you see this watch as a piece of design it feels like something that has been developed it doesn't feel like it's fully fully fledged is that the right word it doesn't feel like it's been fully pushed into the final form it has this 
this prototype build around the two, which I like. But these things are just insanely priced. I mean, 1.2 to 2 mil, they're expecting these to go for. They don't. They didn't make many of these pieces, so it makes sense. Uh, they have some in ceramic now, I think, full ceramic cases that have been greatly hyped up, unfortunately. Blackbird, great song. <laughs> Eric says, the Blackbird, yeah. Uh, Megan says, don't worry, I'll have it. Good luck, Megan. I hope you win it. I really do, because it is a gem. I really like this piece just for the sake of it being, uh, it's fun. It's fun. It doesn't feel like it's it's holding back. You know, it's got this, this flair to it. Moritz Grossman. Now, we were chatting about this watch earlier this week, actually, with, um, with Rick. He just picked up one of these pieces, this being a fine, attractive, limited edition platinum variant, and another watch that just has this own defined language. What we, we were looking at, we were looking at a Grossman earlier, weren't we? With, um, oh my gosh, my nose is itching so badly. Uh, <clears throat> a model with those very sharp pointed hands. Hmm. If they made it in the flesh, it is no longer a concept. That's true. Okay, let's say I'll say prototype then. Does that sound better, Justin? Oh, my nose. Hold on. Uh, scratch. Um, I'll say prototype then. I won't say concept anymore. Uh, it, it's kind of it's a word that's loosely thrown around the office. You could say, really nice arrangement here. Sub dial. It's it's very clean. Love the needle hands. The way the 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 bridge has been remained. I mean, it's it's impressive to see that this manufacturer is so true to form. And I'm trying to remember how this pusher works. It's similar to the Weems uh, model, the Weems Omegas and the Weems Longines, uh, where they have these the single pusher here. I think what it does is, hold on, you don't pull out the crown to set the watch. You push that little pusher in, and then you can turn the crown to set the time, as far as I know. Perfect for Flieger Friday. Yeah, it's great. Uh, and it's just the balance is really nice. I must say, of all the things, the numerals don't really grab me, sadly. I don't know what it is. I think it's, it's. I would prefer to see the numerals italicized, you know, sloped a little bit in the direction. The way they're, it's all very, I mean, it's typical to what we would expect from Glasuta, don't you think? It's very direct, right? Uh, if these If these numerals had a bit of a curve to them in some way, maybe that would add some more vibrance. But then this is not a brand that's going for that. They want to be really focused in on that aesthetic. I know Blue Shirt loves this. Look look how thin those hands are. It is great. It is some, it's quite a feat. I think I said earlier that they have a record of making the thinnest hands out there. Faux enamel dial. I mean, there's lots of little things to take away from it. Faux enamel dial. Uh, it's, it's platinum, of course, so it's nice and weighty. Yeah, it's great. It's a really nice piece. The, the, one, the one drawback for me, at least, is I find it to be just a bit too careful you know, after looking at that AP uh, concept watch, it's just nuts. Jumping next to 859, sorry, 959. <laughs> Why did I feature this watch? This is probably one of the most hated MBNF pieces out there. It's, it's a dive watch. And I find it fun. I mean, let's, why not? Let's just dig in and have a good look at this. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think I need to get a fisherman's out. What should I do? Coffee first, fisherman's later. Okay, coffee. So very impressive, unusual, which is Philip's speech of saying not to everyone's liking, oversized limited edition pink gold tourbillon. Now, this watch catches a lot of flack, as you're now seeing in the chat. People are going mad. Uh, I, can, I can understand why. It's just so bizarre. I actually want to look at it in more detail, just for fun. <laughs> Hideous UFO lookalike. No, not MBNF era. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love you guys. I love you guys. It's so funny. Um, sorry that I'm missing you in the chat. I'm going to have to like scroll up. Megan says, beautiful about the Morris. Beautiful, beautiful watch. Rick is going to love it. Yep. And now everyone is just really ripping into this machine. <clears throat> so Megan says, it's really fun. That's how I feel about it. Why do all watches have to look the same? Um, I, I, I find it, isn't it cool to see that it has negative space around the bezel? Can you imagine? I, I'm just thinking of the process of development and conceptualizing this thing. <clears throat> Can you imagine the thought? I need to get fishermen's in. I can't be clearing my throat every five seconds. Fisherman's friends, simply the best. Cherry flavor going in. It looks like those lugs articulate. That is so cool. When I think of the sketching and all of that, that we <laughs> when, I'm just like the chat's just going nuts. That is so funny. Um Hundred twig. I'm, like, I'm gonna have to catch up with these. Okay, I just want to get my piece. When I think of um, the the sketching and the concept that went into this, the thinking that went into the process of 
of course, that's their typical arrangement of having a domed setup there. It must have taken so much time to think through how this watch was going to be done. Thomas, you nailed it. I mean, this is the true like Roswell 1950s alien watch. Look at that rotor. Isn't that cool? I think that's exactly what they were going for. Do they call this like the alien? Is that the description, the UFO machine? Okay, let's look at the criticism. <laughs> okay, let's have a look. So 120 click bezel, samurai. I have less idea than a goat. Saturn vibes, yes, for sure. Looks like the Saturn watch. I don't know what the double crown situation is. I'm guessing the, oh, I know exactly. The one crown is probably for winding and the next is for setting the setting the time. Yeah, weird, just so weird. Uh, Truth Fear says, I, I, love, I, I love you all. I'm sure I do. I'm still trying to see what time it is. So, Mark, I'm judging it's 10.10. Oh, my gosh, this magic mouse. I'm circling it here at the base. Where the 10 and 10 intersect at that blue point, I think that's how you read it. You have to look at down. Of course, the beauty of the three-dimensional arrangement is that you have to, like, tilt your wrist and get all that. I, I think this is great. I mean, honestly, I would be bidding on this watch. I find it just so fun. I mean, it's like a tourbillon in the middle, and it's just... It's not how you would expect a dive watch to be. <laughs> it's so funny. Uh, Forbin says, this MBNF should be worn around the neck with some sort of communications device. Welcome to the show, Forbin. Not a bad point there. 53 point how much? Holy, 54 millimeters in diameter. Okay, that makes a difference. That, that changes the game. God, it's so fun though. I don't know why I'm enjoying it so much. It's a drone. Um, Dad has every machine from MBNF's collection. Not all look the best, but they are fun to play with me. This is one that I think does it's just, yeah, it's, you never see this. You never see this kind of stuff. <laughs> uh, you guys are great. The Jetsons. Okay, I'm going to move on. This is, this watch is getting too much hatred. Uh, I think it deserves some love. Not the most legible. I, I like the whole negative spacing situation they've done there. Not very easy to see on the screen. There we go. That might work. Negative spacing between the bezel and the dial. It's just a fun love and watch. And of course, I screw up the scrolling. Hold on a sec. Okay, jumping next to 960. This is also an outlier, I think. Yeah. I missed. There was another work that I think I missed earlier on. Maybe I didn't. I don't know. I probably did. Uh, this, These watches all deserve a bit of love. This one is huge, though. 47 millimeter width, 51 mil in length. This is the fighter pilot, the stealth stealth pilot watch and i love the fact that these auction houses are covering these pieces <clears throat> i'd love i'd love to get my hands on a, a ur100 flavor flav as hans mentions that was so funny earlier but squire next eric don't worry we'll get there um it's a good drone that's a belt buckle oh you guys are the worst great comments i'm loving it i'm loving it please keep the humor going that's what's keeping me going uh, Curtis says, I normally don't like MBNF, but this one speaks to me. Somehow, if I submitted this design in my college class, I'd get an F. Unfortunately, when it comes to being bold creatively, it's it's difficult to get across to people. Iron Man had Uruk. Yes, he sure did. This is a awesome machine. The UR, this is a 100. I love these things. They're just, so, it has an oil change indicator at the bottom there. Uh, it's, I don't even know what half of this does. Let's see what the description says. Satellite time display. Does it actually have like a Bluetooth? I don't even freaking know. Day night indication, oil change, guarantee, and fitted present. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 53 pieces of 55. It's just so fun. Double tourbillon. I mean, the way these, correct me if I'm wrong, the way these work, there's like this intake system where they like it pulls air into the watch or something. Maybe I'm completely wrong, but they try to make it really feel like a stealth fighter and they, they did it. Just wish they weren't so big. I mean, this is huge. But still, I guess if you're measuring it across, if you're wearing this watch on the right wrist, you're in good luck. It's uh, awesome. Still, 10, it has, of course, it's a, it's a, the way this rotation arrangement works, it's just so true to Uruk's approach. It's it's just awesome. So, so awesome. Uh, Taser, don't like, does it, does it have spark plugs too? Probably. Um, probably has a distributor cap in there somewhere as well. You have to change the, the plugs. Okay, I think it's just fun. Another thing to notice is just how the the, the brace, the strap articulates. It looks really good, and it, it conforms to the wrist a bit better. I don't even know what the material is. Titanium, so it's obviously been brushed very nicely, and yeah, I like it. There's another one. <laughs> yeah, but it looks horrible, George says. That's so funny. Yeah, I mean, it's <clears throat> put it this way. Do you like cars like the Pagani Zonda and those out, real outreaching pieces? This This falls into that category, I think. Um, Night Rider operates. Yes, I mean that's it, Foreman. 
uh, blinker fluid. Oh, you guys, it's great. I love it. There's another one, I think, 961. I think that's the next one. This one's a bit tamer. Yeah, okay. This one's a bit tamer. Again, I much prefer looking at this over the Nautiluses and the Royal Oaks that we see every single day. This is the UR100V iron. I don't know what this is. So it's titanium, stainless steel with titanium, okay? Uh, orbiting satellite hours. I don't understand what that means. Are they trying to like, is that how they explain how the, the, the arrangement works? I guess. Uh, distance traveled on Earth and distance traveled by Earth indication. What? Oh, okay. So there's like a, there's like a, a it's not like a power reserve on the side there. Oh, okay. That kind of makes sense, I guess. Not really, but okay, fine. I love the aesthetics of these things though. You look at the movement at the back, you've got this huge opening, beautiful rotor. Again, this is a boy's toy, as as most of us know. Oh, and, and crown at the 12, yeah, it's a nice feature. This is what they do with a lot of them. I think they also have some with the crown of the six, if I'm not wrong. Limited edition to 25 pieces, sadly. And the way you tell the time, I'm sure most of you know, we featured these on Wrist Shot Week before. We we're, uh, we're lucky with someone like Megan to, who can send these in. Um, the way you tell the time is you read that hour being, the, oh my gosh, magic mouse. The hour being 10, this thing obviously hates me. The 10 at the base there, and then it moves oh my God, moves to the left, hits the 60, and as it hits the 60, so the 11th hour would jump down, and then you'll be able to read the time that way. It's very simple time telling at the base. Um, it looks better. This looks better than the last one, Thomas says. It's more concise. It's and 41 mil by 49. Most of us could wear this watch pretty well, and it has the articulating lugs, which is cool. Um, the way to, you wear the tell you time is ask someone. Hmm. That's it. That's it. Um, it's also a girl's toy. Let's not be sex. Okay, make it. Okay, sorry. I'm so used to saying boy's toy. Girl's toy as well. Um, really cool. Feels, I mean, how best can we describe it? Reminds me of a watch that you would expect to see from like the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, don't you think? Yeah, there's lots to take in. Anyway, I won't hang on this for too long because I know it's definitely not a watch for everyone. We're going to be seeing some more vintage Rolex in a second, though, I think. Uh, girl's toy. I don't know if many girls would like that piece, though. It's very, very hardcore. It's That's funny. Actually, a very good point. Speaking about how many designs today are so masculine, that one definitely speaks to the more masculine approach. Why did I choose this AP? Well, how often do we see a round cased AP watch nowadays? Platinum, skeletonized. I don't even know what this watch is called. But repeating, 2017, this is not old. I'm guessing they only made a few of these. Um, yeah, it's great. Just great. What's, what's the back? Um, we're talking about this watch still. Sorry, I'm missing you in the chats everywhere. And there's all sorts going on. Uh, yeah, Megan is a great, she's a good laugh. It's great fun. Uh, Metropolis. Is that what we're talking about? This piece, is that what they call it? They have, they have a couple of examples. I mean, this being a jump hour, which is really nice. It's a cool complication. I think what grabbed my attention the most about it is that contrasting rose gold with the platinum, and how it actually works. The watch is semi-legible, can we say? <laughs> yeah, it's an AP. It is an AP. It looks a little dated. It sure does, yeah. I think it's also a minute repeater, judging by the, the pusher on the side. Unfortunately, the, the thing that really detracts from it is that blued second. I mean, you can never say that a blued hand ruins the watch's approach, but I mean, the idea of a blued hand is for legibility, and sadly, you can't see it for days. Um, it also has a, a zenith arrangement of a skeletonized date that runs around us. Look at the movement at the back. God, look at those bridges. That is stunning. So, of course, it's another outlier. It's a watch we never see, but at the same time, I think it's it's good to see these pieces in the flesh instead of the typical watches we associate to uh, H.R. Geiger design. That's it. What did Hansi say? I missed him. Uh, Metropolis. Mm, does feel that way, most definitely. Um, looks like I'm in a cathedral. Yeah, you could say it's got that rosette pattern that we would expect to see. Rose gold hand would have been better. Yeah, Neferion, I mean, I'm thinking a white hand. Just a painted white hand would make a big difference. So that's, and also for the seconds, I mean, you can't read the thing at all. As Megan mentions, it looks dated. It sure does. I was actually expecting this watch to be made from the 90s, not 2017. Anyway, good one to look at. Another outlier that we don't see very often. We're hopping to 965 next. Crossing that off the list. Ah, oh, now we jump into back to our vintage Rolex. 5508 is a nice selection coming up now. Uh, very fine, well-preserved, blah, blah, blah. 1962, 37 mil diameter. 
I just love how these dials were arranged back then. Two lines of text, this being an underline, which is also really nice. Glossy black. I mean, you wouldn't even be able to tell that this is a gloss dial. Condition is pretty good. Has seen some polishing. But uh, overall, the reason why I like highlighting this watch is something that I always say is I wish they could go back to these roots and uh, and bring in. <laughs> Was the dog chewing on the bezel? Let's have a look. Looks pretty good. Uh, the insert, you're talking about the insert. Of course, the Magic Mouse is not cooperating. The insert looks a little bit frayed, but this is if this is all original, that's pretty damn impressive. Uh, this being a gilt dial, of course. Look at the flatness to these cases. I mean, some of these early models still had manual wound movements, I believe, don't you think? Uh, as far as I know, I'm not the most well-versed when it comes to the history of these, these models, but rivet bracelet is nice, the thinness of the profile. Um, you know, we think of where the dive watch is today at 41 mils. I think you still would get the same efficiency out of a 37 mil, 38 mil. Yeah, we, we're talking about unisex watches today, and where exactly could that be placed? Imagine they brought out a watch like this in 38 that, that could fit all wrists and still feel very appropriate. 38 is a great size. You're dealing with a lug length, which is relatively the same, of like 47 mils. Hmm, bezel doesn't match at all. Am I wrong? Is this supposed to be a Bakelite? Can someone help me? I'm uh, most definitely not covered. 5508 from 1962. Yeah, amazing patina. Looks great. Uh, bezel has had some wear, that's for sure. Does have a bit of ghosting going on. But the condition is the dial condition is great, especially being an underline and all of that. Okay, there's a few more for us to look at. 966. Now you notice the arrangement. Here we go. Here's our pussy galore. What is it? 6542, crossing that off the list. Bakelite bezel. The dial looks like it's experienced a bit of degradation, as you would expect. Um, roulette date. There's so many things to enjoy here. I don't know if these original ones had Cyclops lenses. I, I think they did. Uh, but the, just, the, just the package of these pieces. Look how they did the end links back then. Very different to what we see today. They have this like serious curvature to them. Let's have a look at the... Whoa, that is strange. Check that out. The whole thing is... That's so cool. This is what I really love. Lots of things you don't normally see. That spring bar is just cruising. It's just floating in there. It's literally held on by like two prongs, and that's it. Just... Oh. It's so cool. And the stamped clasps. I mean, a lot of these things we don't see anymore, sadly. But just the way it's been done, the arrangement. I think these were still brass crowns back then. And same with the bezel. They were brass bezels. Uh, yeah, really nice. The condition especially. The one thing to always take away from these is looking at the condition of the bezel. These Bakelite bezels are rarer than hen's teeth. So, uh, okay, I'm missing you in the chat. Let's, let's carry on. Keep on moving. Are we, is this a song we're talking about now? Uh, Jazzy B, Perpetual Moody, Showing Up in Boots. I don't know what these references are. These are all music references. I don't know. Uh, Back to Life. Big J is on form. However you need me, Hans says. 200K. I'm sure it will go. For, I mean, easily. So between 650 and a million is the estimates. These normally fetch crazy, crazy prices. Difficult to know if these these collectors actually you know page through these lots and and hallmark the ones they want to see because this one deserves some love these are some of the rarest out there to find and uh, that's just it guys are just dropping in song lyrics and i'm missing it completely rolex's idea behind the perpetual is so you don't have to wind it as to preserve the water seals <clears throat> that's a good point very good point the whole perpetual arrangement yeah i mean screw down screw down crowns and all that stuff it's a jam 1957 and and curtis saying wow it's a great model it's awesome it really is nice. People mod Seikos with Bakelite bezels. <laughs> I know they do. Yeah, these these vintage examples. Isn't it sad that we're not seeing the fully loomed bezels today on these pieces? Uh, this is great. That is what I call music. Isn't that... I mean, I remember the, the, now, the now CDs from back in the day. Do they still do that? Do they still run those? Don't know. Been a while. 967 next. I like this. 5513. Step Up is a 90s pop game. Okay, okay. Yep, Justin. Since I was born in the 90s, I probably missed a few of those references. Sorry about that. 54, now 97. I'm I'm completely lost. So chatting about the 5513. Retailed at, at Serpico Leno. Okay, must be a retailer. There's no... Oh, I see. There's actually a stamping on the dial there. Who doesn't like a semi-tropical lacquered dial? 
isn't it funny that that these aged watches are the ones that are collecting the most amount of money back in the day? Are oh, these guys just jump? What are these? Are these lot numbers that you're putting on the? I don't know what's happening. Yeah, gotta love Tropic Dials though. Has making mentions. It's really clean, really neat. I just I have this this aversion to seeing Tropic Dials that aren't fully tropicalized. When there's this fade to them, ugh. and at, at the end of the day, it's it's <clears throat> you're, you're celebrating wear and you know sun damage. It's like, are you going to buy an old person because of their all the spotting they have on their skins and the wrinkles and all of that? That's technically what you're appreciating here, the wrinkles on the watch. <laughs> um, lovely use of bleach. That's one way to get around it, hey? Bleach the bezel. <laughs> Look at that loom plot. I mean, we talk about the infected case back sticker. That loom plot looks like I could really cause some harm. <laughs> um, what is this, 1965? So they were out of the radium phase, this being all tritium. Pretty impressive that there is still loom there. I don't know how they've managed to keep it in. Um, got your number on the wall. Megan saying 175 plus US dollars, your prediction. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested. I mean, looking at just the case condition. Isn't it funny? Like the case condition doesn't reflect the condition of the dial and the bezel. That's what I find strange. You look at the sharpness of those lugs. It has been polished before. You can see that it's not evenly polished. Ooh, there's actually a spring bar sticking out that side, and it's clear here. But the the actual the dial and everything feels like it's it's experienced more wear than the case has. Uh, buying old people, yeah, wristwatch. Uh, that's that's how I'm going now. I'm I'm completely lost. It. I think more coffee is needed. <clears throat> Let's check this one off. I mean, these always show up at auctions, and are worth looking at. They deserve love. Six two four one nineteen sixty nine. A watch of its time that resembles a real sporting classic. Okay, coffee in. They basically just put it under UV lamps. I wouldn't be surprised, honestly, Neferion. I mean, one way you can age a watch would take a while. I'd be very interested in experimenting with that, wouldn't you? <clears throat> the whole idea of aging a watch artificially just under an insane UV light for like a month and see what happens guarantee you the result would be quite fascinating also add a bit of moisture in the i mean you could do this whole thing where you have a um like a light box in a way just a uh what's the word perspex a perspex box arrangement with uv lights and just kill the thing and then have this a system where every day there's a little vapor machine that that emits vapor in the box too there's a, maybe a vacuum that sucks it out the watch will get all the moisture and uv exposure Done deal. I'd love to see that experiment. Anyone out there willing to experiment, uh, let me know. I would gladly take your vintage watch and try and age it. Even a modern one. Give me a, a five-digit reference sub. I'd gladly like to experiment with that. All right, it's between 3.4 and 5 mil. This is expected to go for in Hong Kong dollars. And it's a really nice example. Rivet bracelets again. I don't know if these were stretch. I, uh, I don't know if these were stretch rivet bracelets at this stage, 1969. <clears throat> I handled a late 60s, 1675, I think, which was all solid gold. And it was a solid rivet bracelet. Still really nice. This will go close to one mil. Yeah, I'm sure it will. I mean, there's so much. This being a lemon dial, right? The lemon dial Paul Newman, which is even rarer. Hold on, hold on. I'm trying to get my bearings here. Um, as far as I know, these models, especially with the lemon finish, are the hardest to get. They've got the white dials and the black dials. This one is equally special. But then the ones with the bezel aren't as collectible as the ones without. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and the blowtorch. Eric, yeah, why not? Just throw in a blowtorch at the end of the week to, to fill in the gaps. Uh, 80s, 80s song only, any genre. Guys are just dropping in lyrics. I love it. Love it. Would love uh, to have the stones to wear a solid yellow gold watch as a daily. It can be done. I think the smaller the watch, the easier you can get away with it too. Okay, 970. You're doing pretty good. How, what's the time looking like? Almost three hours. That's pretty amazing. Considering there's over 300 lots, and and this will probably still end up being a bloody four-hour long show, but at least, <laughs> but at least there is some form of consistency here. Okay, now why did I choose this? Well, unfortunately, this watch has a serious cult following now, and everyone likes a 1655. It's the most peculiar, ugly duckling of the Rolex brand, and deserves a bit of love. Don't we all wish that we saw this recreated this year with the, uh, the anniversary of the Explorer 2? Anyway, can't imagine this Rolex Chrono would fetch at least one mil. Won't fetch. Yeah, that's it, George. I as far as I know, the lemon dials are very sought after. Talking about that.
that Paul Newman. Between 95 and 160 is the estimated price here. And condition-wise, pretty good. The case looks like it has been polished once or twice. I mean, th the dial condition is excellent. And again, these watches were just never really used. I mean, no one bought these things, which is really funny. Uh, the Dream Rolex, I'd love one of these, of course. I mean, who wouldn't? This being a Mark II, interesting. I thought this was a frog foot, but it's not. It's a Mark II dial. Uh, some things I look for when I, when I specify these, it's good to see that all the all the numbers are painted in properly. Maybe someone went in and touched up those those elements. Uh, the case, yeah, the only downside is the case polishing a little bit much. There is another one we're going to look at later, um, which is going to be fun. But condition-wise, it's really nice. And a good way to point if it's a Mark I or Mark II generally is that the Mark Is have a solid hand, no, no loom plot on it. That's something to look for. Taking a hit from the whiskey, why not? Oh, very smooth, considering it's single malt and like 40%. Okay, any more comments? Megan says 35 US dollars for this. A few in the auction I viewed yesterday. Yeah, I mean, you guys love these pieces. It's, it's great. I mean, it's, it's nice to see the community all appreciate the ugly duckling. Maybe it's just because it's so much of an outlier and doesn't look like a Rolex. And I wish, I so wish more, more of their watches had this feel to them because today they all look the same. No, mostly. S sorry, don't get it. <laughs> uh, it's funny. Is that Han saying he doesn't appreciate it? I mean, it is definitely, again, talking about prototypes and all of that. The Rolex P01. Uh, Eric says, do the rest of the show in a Hugh Bladen impersonation. Yeah, Eric, I don't even know who that is. How bad is that? I really don't know. Um, again, we're talking about a musician. I don't even know who Hugh Bladen is. Sorry, it must be the alcohol in my brain. Okay, jump into 972. Let's have a look. 972. These are more vintage Rolexes, I think. Look how many. I mean, the drop-down box. Look how many are still to go. Good grief. It's ridiculous, man. Right. 972, 16750. I think Curtis will appreciate this watch because he owns one. This being the transitional, we start seeing uh, it still has the acrylic, acrylic bezel. Sorry, the acrylic uh, crystal. It now has a matte dial as far as I know and has gold surrounds around the new so it's this, this neo vintage it's right on that cusp of being a neo vintage piece there so it's it's a gem if very expecting a six hour stream did you see how long that list is Gee, thank god i managed to specify what i wanted to look at because it would take all day at least we get again that the theme of this the title of the, the show is highlight <laughs> even the highlight ends up being three and a half hours yeah condition of this watch is great it's been polished once looking at the lugs but still it looks brand new this is the kind of watch i would jump on oh, wearing my 1655 to the auction today oh megan don't do it don't do it making me so jealous uh this is the kind of watch i'd be bidding on because of the condition because it looks so so clean for what it is and it has all the original paperwork all of that too deserves deserves some love oh beautiful okay we've seen enough of these gmts i'm sure there'll be more later uh we're jumping now all the way to 978 i wonder why let's have a look at 975 oh that's why because all of these are very like cliched at this point uh, the standard references i think there is modern uh called the modern daytonas this being a zenith yeah we've seen so many of them i tried to avoid all the repetition as much as possible this one i wanted to look at because you don't see the cream dial very often and i don't know if this is from age or if this is just a manufacturer situation 2001 this being after the zenith i think this is just after they transitioned out of the zenith movements to in-house you can see that by the sub dials being pushed up a little bit at the top uh i really like the cream dial arrangement why don't more watches have cream dials look how cool that is you know it's it's so easy to make a sellable watch today take a modern sports watch chronograph give it a cream dial done deal i mean that's all you need to do yeah good nick it's still got a, a sticker on the back i don't know if that's the original but if so good luck putting that on your wrist you might need to wear some antiseptic okay vanilla ice cream dial i mean that's it right that really is it uh, and uh, thomas is helping guys out with names people's names in the chat and i do not know what's going on it's all good splash of red is perfect yeah man just add some dynamic net quality to it the one downside is just all of the scripts that i think this watch could do without the beauty of that that uh, prototype dial we saw earlier was it was just so clean anyway one one six five two zero 
this is like that transitional right out of it, 2001. Next one, though, 97, what is it, 98, 979, I think. This Explorer 2 is worth looking at, <clears throat> being the transitional 16550, you know, 1655, add the zero, there's your result. And a lot of these, like there was some def defect with the paint. A lot of these went cream, which is really cool. And this is a beautiful example. If I was in the bidding to, uh, tomorrow, this is the watch I would also be bidding on because the condition is stunning. The hands, ooh, the, I can see the GMT hand looks like it's been replaced. That sucks. But I mean, it's just fun. Cream rail dial. I, I think the way they've got this transitional looking bezel to it also feels peculiar. I'm also quite the lover of the Polar. I mean, I experienced the last reference of the Polar dial a couple of months back you know, on the solid bracelet just as it was transitioning out. I think the very last, before the, the 42 mils were introduced, there's something special about them, really. And this one just adds that little bit of dine. I mean, the downside is you can't really read it very well because everything is cream. The patina, <laughs> the patina on the dial and the, and the numerals look exactly the same, which is strange, very strange. Um, so Curtis says, the reference 16750, the matte dial and non-surround painted markers were phased out late 84. Okay, thank you for that, Curtis. And I think the one we saw was an 85. Um, hold on a sec, red Daytona lettering. Isn't that what, aren't all the watches with red at the moment? I'm pretty sure all the modern ones have a red highlight there. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm completely lost. Uh, is this Gordon Ramsay's? Does he wear one of these? I don't know. Yeah, I, I think it's stunning really worth looking at just from a age perspective and the condition is so nice this is something i would definitely check on the list 981 let's move next two rows down what do we have let's see okay why did i choose these i like the dials japanese lacquer dials i'm not going to try and say should i try <clears throat> and try and say the names getting into the chat this is a show pod by the way which i didn't i actually thought these were pateks would you believe I had no idea that these were show parts when I chose them. Megan says this looks too expensive. Uh, I've been seeing these in Hong Kong also in the US much cheaper. Oh, really? Really? Okay. And that's the thing. I mean, it's the way to milk the, the collector market, having these show up at the auction houses in such good nick and hop on the, the patina bandwagon. Okay. So this was a dial made by Kishiro, Masumura, and Yamada. Haidano, Haidano, I tried. I tried my best. Certificates, presentation boxes. <clears throat> so we have reindeer. I don't know my, my Japanese folklore and, and all that, so I'm probably going to butcher this a lot. They look like greyhounds or they look like deer, I don't know. Uh, dragon, of course, is pretty symbolic. Nice looking arrangements, and I am quite a sucker seeing these lacquer dials. Got the sticker on the back from 2011. 39.5 is a pretty good size. Definitely not for everyone. Uh, it's the final countdown. Are we still throwing in our, our <laughs> music references? <laughs> um, yeah, Gordon Ramsay wears one, paid 7,000 in mint position. Oh, he's talking about the, the cream dial. And Thomas also mentioned nice rail dial in the polar. It's beautiful. It really is beautiful. Um, anyway, these are love it or hate it things. I'm, I don't know if the, the, the logo is actually applied to the crystal. Okay, I've got to move on. I think we do have a few more close in a models in a second. Let's see, 982. Hey, now we're talking. Look at that. Very rare and attractive wood. I can't even, I'm not even trying to pronounce that. Was that a, Mar a Marquetri dial? Hunter case back. That's really nice. 2016, 38 mil diameter, 38 and a half mil diameter. 175th anniversary. Russell, this is the kind of watch for you. I think you would love this. Uh, great colorway. That's what's actually that's what drew me to the watch. Also, really dig the Hunter case back. It just adds that depth and dynamic to it. Um, I love how the brown strap is paired with the dial. Uh, a symbolic Japanese animal, a deer. Am I wrong there, Eric? I mean, I don't know much about the culture. And yes, uh, I need Austin Daniels at this point in time. I sure do. I mean, he would be able to give me the full rundown of all that stuff. Um, reference five zero eight nine G, and this is not a cloisonné dial. I don't even know how this is with a wood. If someone can explain what a Mar Marquetri dial is, that would be nice. Um, who would wear this on the wrist? Uh, Megan's asking. Sadly, this is when these watches have transitioned out of being owner, you know, enjoyment pieces and collector pieces, unfortunately. Father's Day gift. <laughs> uh, and, and Megan says, do love the Hunter case back. There's something charming. I like the fact that you can engrave it. 
sadly they have to cover it with their engravings but then you know you got this of course you can hide whatever you want back there which is also really nice especially for when you're doing four hour live streams it comes in handy and and russell says he would wear it it's beautiful is this i'm guessing this is lake geneva don't don't crucify me anyway gorgeous looking model though uh 983 next i think we have another example of a cloisonne if i remember right yeah these are cool again just a real outlier it's, it's amazing to see that patek did so much of this stuff back in the day of course this being the butterfly fish which is quite ubiquitous when it comes to uh salt water tropical fish keeping um fine platinum rectangular shaped yeah i've got that description spade style hands i know how much you love spade hands megan so this one's for you uh, i think the dial arrangement's also very not ooh, not a fan of the of the screws at the back don't tell me this is a quartz please 2007 it can't be this, this immediately draws me to thinking it's a quartz watch when you have the screws at the back there um okay i'll say that the case is very uninspired looking i mean that's that's an easy way of putting it but I do like how the dial has been done where you have this, just look, think of it as a painting where you look at the thirds and how everything's been done. You've got a slightly oversized fish at the top, a little bit smaller at the base. There's actually a running seconds at the bottom here. You can't even see it's like stuck in its tail. And then you have the sea urchins on the offset, which is quite nice. That's a bit too heavy though. I think it draws too much attention on here. Maybe having the urchins on the left-hand side would be better which would counterbalance the weight of the fish. We're getting really technical on nothing. <laughs> it's great. Uh, Mason says, Marquetry is the art and craft of applying pieces of veneer. You are kidding me. That is awesome. So that's actually a wood veneer that they've applied there. So it's like a mosaic, but with wood. I should know this. This is terrible. I mean, did that stuff in university. Mirror blade for me. Mirror blade. We're talking about the, the finish of this. I don't know. I don't know. Guys are just got this is going nuts. The dial is quite exquisite. It is pretty beautiful, considering. Really is. The case reminds me of a Hermes watch. Looks like a quartz. You guys are so nice. I love you. This is fantastic. The Nemo watch. It's gonna get worse though. I think we do have clownfish next. Um, it's a diver. It's built for divers, right? Yeah, for sure. There is another one though, I think. 984. I love, I do love the way they've applied the paint though. It's pretty. Okay, not the Nemo watch. This is also a butterfly fish. I can't, what does it say? Crown butterfly fish. Okay, close the name. This is a better balance, I guess, better allocation of space. I just highlighted these because I thought it gave us a nice bit of color to enjoy. Uh, again, the one thing that just draws it down for me is that the case looks so, so uninspired. The tiger fish. Oh, you know how much I love tiger fish. Thanks, Megan, for that. Uh, 5076p. Yeah, nice. Uh, small seconds, 30 mil width, 43 mil length. It's going to go for crazy money, I'm sure, because, because it says Patek on its um, hip to be square. Yep, that's it. Okay, let's jump to 987 next. This one has definitely not lasted the test of time. What's this? Okay, the reason why I chose this We've seen a couple of these before, but I don't think we've ever seen one with a with a loom arrangement on the on the dial, which is quite nice. Um, no error how he spelt his name, Patrick Philippe. We're still talking about still talking about musicians and whatever lyrics in the chat. I feel I feel like these are gift shop watches. Oh, that is that is so Sam Ray. That's one of the best comments of the show. <laughs> gift shop watches on a super luxury cruise ship. That is so funny. Yeah, the handouts, right? They're the things you get given as you're as you're disembarking. Um, all right. So uh, the five two zero four. There there are serious enthusiasts out there that could explain these watches better to us. Twenty eighteen. So this is quite recent. Forty mil diameter. So it's pretty contemporary size. And it's got all the trimmings. It's a split time. It's got the full perpetual arrangement. It's got the quarters of the years, beautiful movement, all that you would come to know and love. Stepped lugs, which is something very traditional. Uh, <laughs> that cruise ship comments, fantastic. Sam Ray, that's brilliant. Um, yeah. I, when I, what I think I like the most about it is the way you notice how the sub dials are actually shifted down a little bit, kind of longer esque. And then you have the loom filled batons, which you don't see often really nice uh somewhere beyond the sea she's waiting for me yeah what is that i can't even remember who sang that but i do know the lyrics kind of sort of okay jump into 988 next we're doing pretty good for time what are we at two almost three hours we're literally two hours 59 wow this thing is cool now i'm not just looking at it from a price perspective i just think the design of this thing looks amazing don't you think it looks good like 
all things considered, it's it's a miniature pizza. Look at those hands. Yeah, I, I kind of like this. I'm not someone who's a big fan of the complicated Pateks, but I just I just enjoy the fact that it's feels very efficient. Efficient, busy. Frank Sinatra. Thank you for that, Sam Ray. Should know this stuff. Three hours, though. Three hours, it ends up uh, grind, grinding down the brain. More coffee in the system. Now we've got boy admiration was a pretty boy. Uh, we're talking about Bobby Darren. Are these all 80s references? Sorry, guys. I'm not keeping up. And Megan saying design is on point. There's there's lots of things to enjoy here. I mean, for one, the windows are actually the same color as the dial. Huge bonus points. Uh, this is for a benefit. I'm not even going to read all of this stuff. It's just it's just hectic. Really nice arrangement. You look at the, the back of the watch. Clean. Stunning. This is going to go for big money. Uh, I've I'm no no guessing. Wow, I didn't even see that. Check the evacuated lugs. This is crazy cool. It's really really nice. I mean, I didn't even expect this. I haven't seen this profile. Evacuated lugs just makes such a difference. It takes down that visual weight. There's a lot more dynamism. <laughs> was that a snort? <laughs> I don't know. Was it? Um, and uh, hey guys, okay, okay. I'm gonna have to try and scroll around to catch up with what's going on in between all the music references that I'm lost with. Sam saying, "Snort." I uh, love the platinum version of this Patek. It is cool. I'm I'm more of a fan of the rose gold. Actually, I'm liking how it contrasts the black, the black dial there. Okay, beautiful. Also enjoy how the moon phase is at the bottom. So you actually have instead of instead of boobs, you now have a bum at the base there, which is quite nice. You know, it adds a bit more uh, more dynamism. Three hour mark, whiskey time, blue shirt. Thank you. I can't believe the show has been going on for three hours already. Jeez, like. Okay, I think it's the coffee. The coffee helps the most. Thanks for the super chat. So it's a uh, it's a joy. I've still got a lot of whiskey left. I've got to be careful. Oh, got to be careful. Very code eleven fifty nine. I think they've nailed the dial on this, though. The evacuated lugs, oh, it looks so good. I, I, I'm not someone who compliments complicated Pateks often, but this does look sublime. Okay, so now we're jumping from 988 to 1004. Why? Well, let's have a look. Let's jump to 997. It's all filler stuff, really. Do, do we want to see modern pieces in this category? Not really. We're quite sick and tired of seeing. I mean, 999, what is there? Okay, GMTs, we've seen so many of these. What is the next number? 1004, if we look at 1002. Okay, this being an Apollo commemorative model. You know, they're not really exciting, all things all things considered. 1004. Now, of course I chose this. Uh, what is it? A, uh, a 311, this being an Ed White? No? Yes? Transitional with a 321 movement? Oh my gosh, it's the modern one. Come on, are they really that desperate at this stage? Why would you put a brand new one of these up for auction? Seriously, man. Don't worry, be happy. I didn't know that being. <laughs> Truth fears, that's it. Uh, yeah, and Omega's nice. Megan saying next. Sure does. Talking about the sniff. Uh, the one I love. So we're chatting about Bob Marley now all of a sudden. Why would they bring him? I, I just don't understand it. This watch literally came out like last year and everyone's been going for it so now someone's trying to chance their arm will this go for above between 100 so was that 12,000 and 20,000 dollars is the expected price for this in, in dollars basically just weird just so so weird where the market goes where the attention is i truly believe this was a vintage one when i saw it at first so that's something okay well we're jumping to 1005 we've seen enough of these it's a beautiful watch no denying but i mean seriously the modern one Hey, we're talking about Type 20s. Here's a Type 20 for you, blue shirts. Uh, this being a 1996, beautiful flyback chrono, beautiful Type 20 styled. Well, they call this, they would call this the Type 20, right? They don't specify it here, but they should. Uh, same, it's, it's the big eye, the Aaron Vale. Yeah, that's the, that's the description. I love the way the loom has gone. The, the patina on the dial is amazing. Mark of the hype beast. That's it, Justin. I mean, this is a way we can gauge it on this page. Good price. Let's have a look at it. Between twenty three and thirty eight, which is what is that? Is that like that's like two thousand two and a half thousand dollars? They want this to. I mean, that's 
sad. So we've said this many times before that if you want to get Brega, this is the way to go. I shouldn't actually say that because most are going to probably jump on these in future, but there is there is so much to take in here. I mean, the big eye aesthetic, the arrangements, gorgeous, beautiful numerals. Mm, there's so much to enjoy. 1996, I think this is one of the originals too. It's a, it's a nice time with the gold crown there on the side. Ah, stunning. The condition is also beautiful. Okay, uh, let's see what else is going on. What do you think? Do you why to so many song references? It's going right over my head. The dollar prices on screen. Gee, Russell. You know, earlier on we were looking at Hong Kong as as this is the three hour mark. You can see I'm starting to lose it. Um, I at the end of the sale you would only see the Hong Kong winning bid. So good point there. So three thousand to to four nine. Thank you for that, Russell. <laughs> uh maintenance maintenance on a brega flyback chrono is nothing is that so mr cassio oak thank you for that point um and and curtis says i love this version as it has a gold crown tip yeah 200 meters water resistance versus 100 yeah going diving with this that would be a charm and and megan says birth year bidding on this oh a birth year brega type 20 that sounds like a win oh the condition is so good too it looks it hasn't been worn it sucks how can you not wear your watches Okay, you took your lucky break and broke it in two. Now, what can be done for you? I'm not even going to try and get that one. Music lyrics, yeah. Okay, 1007 next. Beautiful condition example. Now, why did I choose this? I think what surprised me about it is that it's it's a it's a 2018 model. It's a Hoya Monza. But, it, I mean, you look at the dial with the, the cathedral hands and the numerals. It looks like something out of, like, 1910. You know, it's it's very old fashioned, but then it has the TV style case that you would expect from the late sixties and seventies. Weird, very. I think that's why I picked Star. I just thought it was weird, weird and attractive. They say fine and attractive. I would edit that out. Uh, cushion shaped, yeah, whatever else. Twenty eighteen. So I'm guessing they made a batch of these. What number two two five of of a thousand of nineteen eleven? Okay, it's an interesting number. Anyway, nice looking piece, a bit strange. Um, <laughs> we're losing him. Uh, what's going on here in the chat? I think I just saw 73 Math. Welcome to the show. We've been running like crazy. What a bizarre watch. It is weird. It is very weird. I think I just chose it because it doesn't look like your, your typical cliche. Uh, how many Hoya watches were named after F1 tracks? Monaco, Monza, what else? I don't know if they, they didn't make a Daytona. That was obviously copyrighted. Uh, they did an Imola, I think. Uh, there's probably a few. There's a good handful. I'm sure someone can help. Um, uh, I'm trying to think. Indianapolis, I think they maybe did. I don't know. I don't know. Forbin Class Cathedral Hands, not this way, please. Yeah, isn't it weird? It's so, I don't even know why I chose it. I just think the, the case might have done something. Okay, now we're jumping from 1007 to 1031. Jeez, I'm harsh. Because a lot of the stuff we've seen, I mean, uh, we can talk about the, the offshore, but we saw one earlier. There's nothing too, too exciting. More Nautiluses. You can notice that I've avoided a lot of them during the show. 1,020. Uh, okay. 1,024. Uh, this is pretty beautiful. Uh, but I think, we're, as we've been chatting about a lot of these through the, the Phillips auction in Geneva, this is the kind of stuff we can move across. Because remember, there's like over 300 lots of the show. I don't know why. I think for this, since this is the third one, I wanted to specify how well some of these examples have been looked after. And this being a, a proper eagle beak, uh, proper, just the condition overall is stunning. The bezel is beautiful. The dial is amazing. Case has been polished unevenly. Oh, makes you cringe when you see the lugs. And of course, the eagle beak is where everyone jumps on these pieces. Um, rare AP. Sorry, Megan, I skipped it. Um, can't even remember what lot that was. I mainly just, yeah, I mainly just skipped through a lot of these pieces because we have chatted about them ad nauseum in the past. Uh, don't bring me down. More music lyrics. Evil woman, evil woman. <laughs> yeah, you're going to slow down, sweet talking woman. These these eagle beak, yeah, and the fairy on. I mean, that's the way these these, these crown guards are like reverse. You notice how it has this peak to it at the front. They only did that for a short time. 1961, pretty. I mean, this is really early. I think this is the first generation of the 1675. I'm not wrong. Um, condition is the first for me. Elo, where's the Grubel 40? I think there is one somewhere. Maybe I saved it. I don't freaking know. Um, Going to California, Zeppelin, Strange in the Night. You guys are just these lyrics. Okay, I'm going to jump next to one zero. Hold on. Haven't looked at the back of this watch. Let's see. Hmm. Nice condition. Pretty sharp. 
again, I just love the profile of these watches. They deserve so much more love. The profile of these vintage pieces, I so wish they did more like them. It's just thin, very trim. It fits the wrist so nicely. 39 and a half mil size. Yeah, and the, and the high top crystal. There's lots to take in and enjoy. Uh, smoke all my stuff, drank all my wine. We're talking, yeah, talking more about Led Zeppelin and all that. Okay, going to hit 1033. And speaking of drinking wine, let's hit another shot of the <laughs> 1655, taking a hit of the whiskey. Correct me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think this condition is better than the first one that we saw. This is a Mark I. Notice by that second hand. I'd be bidding on this piece. Uh, Megan says it's going to sell well above predictions. Yeah, I agree. That that 1675, I, of all the ones we've seen, I think that's the most just clean example out there. So the Mark I, I think I'm more of a fan of the Mark I 1655 with the of course, got the frog foot and that long seconds hand. The patina is not as even as the Mark II that we saw. Uh, the other the other 1655 was better. Okay, more spelunking. Again, I'm just judging by the lugs and stuff. We've seen a couple of polishings. Uh, again, nice condition though, all around. I really enjoy the Mark ones being the, the OG, the one that started it all. Yeah, I'd bid on all of these just for fun. It is nice, right? Megan says it's so much better. I think that pointed hand just speaks more to, more to how the, the hour and the minute hand works. You know, everything's straight. It's not cluttered. It's much clearer. And the spelunking watch, as Justin mentioned, that's pretty funny. Uh, it's the truth, though, right? And this is a frog foot. Who came up with the name? Collectors. I tell you what, the Rolex collectors, we talk about uh, all the terms, the ghosting, tropicalizing, uh, spider dials, pointed crown, uh, eagle beak. We have squared crowns. We have... Uh, flat fours and it just gets worse and worse it's so deep you have to buy a couple of books to learn uh junior johnson says gonna go change the bonfire enjoy your evening junior i don't know what time it is that side it's just ticked over 1 p 1 a.m in the uk uh it's it's crazy it's so i really appreciate it. everyone who has been joining in i really appreciate you joining and being a part of these shows it's always good fun just to laugh around the pieces and in the chat i don't know what's happening but you know it's, it's great chatting about references and all that stuff open nine Good point. It's great to see open numerals on the date windows. Stuff they just did back then. Oh. Again, the, the quality the quality marker for me when looking at these, I love seeing a bezel that's fully painted. There's no like paint missing anywhere. The dial is in great nick. There's no like corrosion anywhere or anything else. Case condition has been polished, but still nice looking example. Uh, okay, Gurner Hop 21034. What next? And in total, there's there's like a hundred she's like there's quite a lot. I think yeah, this is just like a, a creature of habit taking these watches in now because I think it's worth looking at the condition of them, judging by the prices of these things. So six two four one, very rare and attractive. Paul Newman being with the bezel. Someone correct me, please. I know Megan, you know your stuff very well. Uh, the bezels being the more in demand than the, the earlier models with the steel bezels. These are a bit more sought after. Correct me if I'm wrong. Gotta love that arrangement though. And it's just, there's some funny things about these watches that are good to to point to point out. Um, 1655 is one of my favorites from the 5513. Yeah, they do. I mean, what I love about those two, Megan, is they're just, they're, they're like worlds apart. <clears throat> they use the same case essentially, but you look at their arrangement on the dials and they couldn't be any more different. And I love that. Nowadays, we're seeing the Explorer 2s, the GMTs, the subs, they all look the same. And sadly, that's what sells, but it's just boring. So, so boring. Uh, cream get top. So something cool to point out is that with these models, uh, this one is not the best example because the loom plots are missing in places. But you notice that there's never actually a loom plot at the 12, I believe. The 12, the 12 markers always bear, which is funny. 1968, 37 mil diameter between 1.2, 1.8. Yeah, I'm sure we'll go for that right roundabout. Polished lugs. Remember, these watches were never worn back in the day. They were pretty much unsellable. No braces affects the price. Very good point, Megan. I mean, that's a surprising, actually. You, you very rarely see these examples without bracelets today. And no box, no paperwork, nothing attached to it. Probably would also devalue it a lot. Um, Paul Newman gave his Daytona to his girlfriend's daughter's girlfriend. <laughs> Truth fears. Oh, that's so funny. His daughter's girlfriend. Okay. Oh, that's that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, it's 
I hope you meant, I hope you were trying to say boyfriend there, but uh, that's it. Eagles in the 70s, oh dear heaven knows, for units per hour on the bezel. Yeah, units per hour, that's all to do with the, the tachymeter arrangements. The idea of the tachymeter is that over a 60 second, no, how long is it? Over a one, over a one mile interval, you can determine how fast you're going, uh, judging by the speed of the chrono hand, which is very, it's a very good system, but I mean, you would only ever use it on a track or on a main straight or something. It's pretty. <laughs> Thanks for that, truth is. Boyfriend, got it. Uh, jumping next to 1043. So we're jumping from 134 to 143. I wonder why. Let's have a look. 138. That's why. Uh huh. 1043. <laughs> I love this thing. This is one of my favorite watches of the show. I kid you not. This is one of my favorite watches of the show. And we're now in the final selection. There's about how many? I would say 12 or 13 more watches to go through before the show is coming to a close, which is pretty good. Three and a half hour stint. Uh, woman love wallets, comfortably numb. Uh, let's see what else is going on. I have a dilemma. Swap my 114270 for the oh, plus three grand, the 1160. Mm. Very different watches, 73 math. Good question, though. Uh, maybe someone would like to like to throw in on that. I mean, it's a GMT. That, no, it's not. 116. That's that's a bluesy, right? Bluesy sub. Ah, uh, it's difficult. Yeah, I don't even know if it was a solid a solid end link bracelet back then. Anyway, so this this watch I'm really loving. And I missed a comment from Curtis. Hold on a second. Hold on. Um, but, uh, so Bo and Eric at LA Watchworks, Pasadena, California, do a phenomenal job in the cases. Yeah, they, they've definitely gotten a huge reputation. Um, and what, yeah, LA Watch Works. If you're based in California, look them up because they really know their stuff. So let's have, a, let's have some fun chatting about this watch. We looked at the crash earlier and I deliberately chose the crash and this watch. I find this to be stunning. Ladies watch, men's watch, whatever. This thing is so damn cool. It has all the quirks that you would see out of a crash. But then at the same time, you've got a diamond set bezel and, and all, all of it, not should I say the diamond set case. When I think of, I mean, what are the comments? Let's have a look. There's probably going to be some some good laugh. Uh, let's see. Because Cassio Oak says, I know people that uh, use the tacky bezel as a chrono um, and the makers on the highway to get around having a broken speedo. That's something. That's really cool, actually. I like that. Uh, so Megan says it's very unique. Yeah, unique. Do they say that in the uh, unusual? Oh, you see, unique generally has a positive connotation for Phillips. When they say unusual, it's, it's more of a negative connotation. So uh, they don't expect this to sell very well. So this is my rationale. Hear me out. You think of the Cartier crash as this watch that survived a car crash, okay? You think of this watch as an example of the crash. What happens when you experience a crash, when you're in a car, whatever else? Glass everywhere. And the diamonds around the, the bezel and everything speak to that in a way. It feels like shattered glass accompanying the watch. Also notice that the, the way that the, 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 the diamonds have been set, different in size, which I really like too. That's just fun, man. It's really fun. And this one really does look like it has been minced. Like, look at it. It feels like it has been driven over. Yeah, I really like this. What the hell is that strap? Is that a leather strap or a, is that a rubber bee strap they're throwing this thing on? Expecting to go diving in this? I don't know. Uh, I love it though. It's so fun. I would definitely bid on this piece. 47 of 200 pieces. What's the size? 32 mil length, 20 mil, 26 mil width. Mm, 2017. Someone mentioned Breaking Bad in the chat from Owl. You won't believe I've just, I'm on the last season of Breaking Bad, season five. I've rewatched it again. I haven't seen the series since like 2012 when, or 2011, whenever it finished. Watching it all in succession, <clears throat> such a good series, man. I love it. I'm so interested in how just the characters work. I've just noticed this as well. Look how the strap integrates into the case. It's like it's jagged too. That's so fun, man. Why don't more watches do that? Megan says, workmanship to make either has has been truly appreciated. Yeah, I'd love on, on to own yeah, both watches. Um, I would love, I, I love how the, let's, I'm losing my eyesight or something here. I love how the leather straps are made to fit the edges. Sam just mentions, yeah, I, it's so cool. I mean, you just don't ever see that. Just the crown being offset. I'd imagine the whole movement is also, if we're looking at it from like a linear perspective, the movement is tilted to a 45 degree angle to match the, the crown. <laughs> So you just saw Gus get his face blown off. No, I'm right at the end of, I'm like the last three or four episodes of season five. Um, this is just when, 
I'm going to try and remember now as I go through. So yeah, gorgeous piece. Let's move on to 1050. I'm at the point now where Jesse is just about to change his identity and, and disappear completely. Why did I miss all of these pieces? Let's have a look. Uh, one, four, six. Okay, more Jeans. We've had a look at so many of these already. Uh, this is a really cool piece. We can actually discuss this quickly. Um, yeah, he's just changed his identity, and now he's going back on the whole ricin story and is like trying to, you know, catch him out. And Hank obviously knows about about the cover up and everything, so it's really good. The last few episodes of the show is just amazing. Yeah, yeah. Ciao, folks. Carl, great having you here. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the banter, the chat. I don't know what's been going on in the chat tonight, but it's been good fun. Safety diamonds, watch power on Stan. Watch power on Stan. Uh, yeah, for, is that a TV series? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Thanks for that, Megan. Gus dies in a season four for sure. He does. Anyway, chatting about this, the rotating numerals on the dial. So let me try and get this right again. The hour, the hour that is telling you the correct time is the one that is fully rotated. So you see that the ten is the one that's high. I really like that little accent dot there. So it's ten, ten, and as the uh, as the time goes, so these rotate and give you the the actual. I really like an indication. It's nice watchmaking. And when you look to that movement at the back, that is so fun. It reminds me of the Turing machine. What's it called? The first like computer. This is how he arranged his his. Uh, were they anodes or something? Similar to how the, the Turing arrangement was. That's cool. Really nice. Strange, peculiar, tiny seconds. Yeah. This is something quite appropriate for a, a 1940s era watch, which is pretty cool. Okay. So we jump into 1050. We're doing pretty good for time. Oh, look at this thing. Lang and Hain, Dresden. This is a maker that deserves so much more love. What a beautiful setup. And of course, what makes their watches very easy to recognize is the uh, the center uh, lug that runs through the middle. <clears throat> Telephone dial. I love that truth. Yes, that's exactly, that, that nails it. Uh, paranoid, tiny seconds. I have changed my mind. Uh, looks like a revolver. Very good point, Samurai. Yeah, it does. It has a revolver aesthetic for sure. Aaron Turing. Thank you for that. So it's Alan Turing bomb. Thank you for that, Eric. Uh, love to own this watch. We were talking about the earlier one, Megan. Yeah, it's nice. So uh, Mason says Breaking Band is seminal television. When you finished it, watch El Camino. I, need, I haven't seen either of those. Good point. I need to watch the follow-ups. Um, yeah, I love it. It's really an interesting series. I, I really <clears throat> appreciate how we see that journey of Walter going from, yeah, I mean, we're talking about movies now. Should I get some more whiskey in me and then carry on? Let's see. I mean, what is not to love about this? A mono pusher, very Georgian in a way. You know, of that time period, you've got the Big Ben aesthetic. I think Big, Big Ben was brought around during the Georgian period. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Uh, but of course, that center, that center lug. I think Bill Sanders owns one of these pieces, if I remember. Oh, beautiful movement. Everything about it is stunning. Also feels very, very German in the way it's been done. Nicely, nicely arranged. So uh, yeah, carry on with the chat. I would watch more TV, but I spend all my time and watch streams. Justin, don't, don't we know it? Uh, Fleetwood Mac, Santana, love Breaking Bad. It's a really good series. Like I, I enjoy. Okay, let's carry on. I'll move to the next piece. Gorgeous arrangement, though. I think it's an enamel dial. Surely it has to be. Uh, yes, it is enamel dial. You have to you have to like pick through all the fluff, and then you see that one word there. It's funny. To a thousand and fifty-six. Can you believe we've done a thousand lots today? Mind blow. So, <laughs> okay, another MBNF that everyone loves. Also, watch Better Call Saul. Apparently, that's been really well received. Yeah, I need to watch. I mean, that's that series has been going on for like four or five seasons now. It's nuts. I'm just loving that whole journey of of Walt and his uh, his downfall, his and then of course the end, his redemption. But it's that whole you can't trust anyone. And just after watching the series back to back, of course, back in the day I was watching it episode by episode over the months. You see just how paranoid he actually is, and. I always had this feeling in the back of my mind that by the end of the season, the end of the series, he was doing a lot less work. You know, he was actually organizing this stuff behind the scenes and he was just sitting back. But in, in fact, throughout the series, he is busting his ass all the way through nonstop. And what I also find interesting is that the whole trip is just about power and just about 
you know, being a success in something, not necessarily about the money. It's about just, you know, being, yeah, you know, talking about how he just uh, came up with gray matter and all that. It's a really good series. Would recommend, ladies and gents, if you've never seen Breaking Bad. Chaz, pleasure having you here. Thank you for joining. Uh, take care of yourself. Have an excellent Sunday. So, MBNF. Uh, rare and unusual. <laughs> so unusual having the negative connotation this time around. Titanium and ceramic. I mean, this is just so the DJ, someone mentioning the DJ watch. <laughs> it's just so bizarre from 2010. That's cool. I like that arrangement there. Yeah, it's it's so weird. It's just too weird. I think I chose it just because it looks like something you would see on a desk. It speaks like, actually works like you would expect to see on a um, automotive clock from back in the day, you know, Hoyas and all that stuff, dashboard things. Uh, Megan's saying that Better Call Saul is brilliant, can't wait for the next season. Okay, I've got to watch that next then. Yeah. Just when I'm thinking I'm done with the Breaking Bad universe, I've got to now jump in and watch the movies and everything again. Uh, for a watch person with no sense and too much money in a ferry on, yeah, I would agree there. This is definitely not for everyone. It looks, I mean, the design, what's funny is the design looks very safe in a way. Very like, 60s-ish. Strange machine. I just thought it would be funny to have a look at. Let's look at 1057. This is also one that's a bit peculiar. <laughs> Harry Winston. Not one we would expect. This, I would imagine, is partnership with Urwerk somewhere. Felix Baumgartner. Hold on a sec. What? Hold on. Hold on. I see F. Baumgartner. I'm guessing he's the, he's the Red Bull guy, right, who jumped out of the satellite, jumped out of the, the balloon. An impressive and rare. Okay, uh, that's uh, that's all up to perspective, I guess. Retrograde minutes, five day power reserve. I think this is just. I chose it because it's quirky, quirky and fun and weird. Opus. I, I feel like they partnered with Urwork for this complication because this looks exactly like how they would do it. Again, not for everyone. Very, very peculiar. Uh, looks like binoculars. Very good point there. Talking about that old piece, sci-fi. Co co costume me good <laughs> don't forget to rewind yeah wow that seconds hand it's weird. yeah very weird love the mbnf machines uh, talk with dad about them i definitely will i think it's worth discussing mbnf on a show once it'll be good um he was the ceo oh okay, so this is a different felix baumgartner this is not the uh the guy who jumped out interesting if the same guy jumped out of the, the satellite it wasn't a satellite um this is way too big. Good Lord. What's the size? 50 mils. Wow. Wow. Does it have to be that big? Like, look, seriously, I can understand. I mean, it's probably to do with the movement and to get all that space in there, but still, it's a little bit excessive for what it is. Still, cool looking piece. I really enjoy the, uh, the funk factor. Bull Sanders is wild about Harry. Yeah, Harry Winston. And the way you can judge by his watches is the way the lugs have been integrated. It's very clean. Harry Winston, never buy it. Harry, never buy Harry and Winston auction. You can buy these in the gray market for virtually nothing at the time. And good point, Megan. Between 40, 460000 and 780000 so that's what? fifty dollars to $80,000. Oh, I'm looking at the bottom here. 60000 to one hundred. That's hectic. What a price. Okay. Going to jump to 1058 <clears throat> Funny, my throat's getting sore. Maybe that's the next side of... Uh, the the allergies the allergies are creeping up on me so another centigraph i like to call this watch the c3po getting probed up the rectum uh, a thousandth of a second it's a very strange piece it's still not one that i'm not i'm 100 percent sure of the, the thing that's nice is that it's easily recognizable for what it is it's for, for its presentation it's easy to read uh it's it's very busy though it rides this line of being a sports watch and a dress watch but also has, uh, it's so difficult to explain. How would you best describe it? It feels like an alien watch. Um, the design is too busy for, for Megan, she mentions. We carry on with the chat. Um, is the Creon protected? Funny, Creon, that's a branch of enzymes. Um, no, the I, I don't know. Talking about the Creon protected. I don't know if Truth Fears says yuck about this watch or the earlier one. It looks like Woody Allen in the sleeper. Lovely. PVD Crown, maybe. I don't know. 20 seconds, 10 minute register, and guarantee. Good to know you get a guarantee with this watch. Um, I must say, I prefer this on a, on a leather strap or on a rubber strap next to the bracelet. And I think I did highlight the rose gold model earlier just to see that that uh, difference between the two. I do much prefer to see it on a, on a rubber strap. 
the the bracelet to me with the little rubber ends feel nah, a little bit too much yeah it is very busy though very very busy okay i'm jumping to 1061 we are going pretty well we have how many left quite a few and i've shortlisted there's about 10 to go i love this thing would you call this the survivor i don't know uh, this thing has grown on me i'm not so much of a fan of the 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 pvd cased model i think it's i think it's a pvd at least or maybe it's ceramic i don't know but the uh, the way this is done, I think what grabs me the most, the numerals on the dial, the fact that the numerals haven't been sacrificed for the space. And I, I do secretly love the way the pushes have been done. Just taking some more time to look at it. Made in collaboration with Arnold for the film Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines, 2004. Definitely not for everyone. Um, okay, I'm going to catch up with the chat. Wilson has just joined us. Welcome. Uh, just got home from watch shopping. Oh my goodness. What have you done? What have you done, Wilson? Welcome. Uh, fidget spinner, Al says, that's a good point. So this is called the T3. Thanks for that, Megan. Yeah, that's cool. I like that little designation. Um, everyone's chatting about the new explorers and stuff. Yeah. Knuckle duster, Mark nailed it. I mean, you could really do some damage with those. It's crazy. But I like, I do like how it's been done. Aesthetic is not for everyone. It's very heavy duty. But the one thing that just speaks to me is how legible, you look at it from a distance, how legible is that dial? You can read the time so easily. Meanwhile, you have a full chronograph set up there. You've got a date complication, which is nicely hidden. And then you've got these crazy crown protectors. I think the, the protectors are really, it's, it's what you would call the survivor. I'm pretty sure that's the, that's the nickname that these go with next to the T3 designation. So Megan says, Dad, are we bidding for this? Yeah, you've got to love these. They're fun. Um, pushers are movie submarine valves. Really? Okay. That's news to me. 48.5 mil. I know that's another thing is the size of these things are just, it's insane. Like how do you even, <laughs> yeah, but the aesthetic for me, also just simple things like, I don't know if you can see this very well on the screen, Magic Mouse cooperates. You've got hours, minutes, and seconds that actually specify underneath the points that there are hours, minutes. So it's easy to break away your eye. You can read it pretty nicely. Okay. Gianna jump to this is 1063. We're almost out of the woods, ladies and gentlemen. This being the Gen uh, Gen 2. Gen 2, Gen 3. God. The Gen, I'm gonna say the Generation 2 Basheron overseas with the big date. The reason why I wanted to look at this is because it deserves more love. The Gen 2 has a, I think a better arrangement next to the Gen 3 that now doesn't have the big date at the top. It's beautiful. The colorway, so many things to enjoy here. Uh, so Megan says the size, 48.5, not a survivor. That is a different watch completely. Goodness gracious. There's so much to learn just within the offshore line. There's a lot to study. Thanks for that, Megan. You're probably the, the one who knows the most about these pieces in this reference range. Um, can't believe the estimate for the AP is 20K. You're kidding, George. I didn't even see that. Nuts. Um, it looks like Arnold will wear the you know, Samurai. He, he co-designed that one for the film. And Mason says, we all like a clean dial, but uh, there is a black art to making an unavoidably busy dial, legible and attractive, possible subject for a design video. Yes, very good. We think of things like the Navi timer. Somehow it's still legible, even though it's cluttered. That Arnold that we just saw, cluttered, but so legible. I think the one underlying, we're going with three and a half hours into the show. The one underlying thing is that there is contrast. There is an understanding of how the, the weight of the line works next to the elements on it. So there's, there's lots of complexity around it, but beautiful little overseas. I love a big date. This deserves a lot more attention. Too Vatican for some, but still, on the other hand, nice, very nice piece. And going to catch up with the chat as. I roll through to 1070, almost finished. Can you believe that we've been running the show for three and a half hours? So, I can't believe it, actually. I really didn't think this was going to be so long. I just get caught up in whatever I'm talking about and give us a bumblebee. Um, yeah, so Wilson, he looks really nice in the rubber strap. Are we talking, sorry, Thomas, we're chatting about the, the Arnold or we're chatting about the last one? I don't know. Ugh, keeping up with the chat. 158. Thanks, Hans. Thank you very much, you guys. You guys are so, so nice. Okay, so <clears throat> singer reimagined. <laughs> Impressive, unusual, and attractive. Yeah, yeah. Ceramic case. What I <clears throat> love 
is that I just swallowed saliva <clears throat> down the wrong hole. And I'm literally choking. Uh, 43 mil diameter. <clears throat> I need some water to clear the throat. I've got a fisherman's friend in my cheek, and what's happened is the uh, the inevitable. Wouldn't it be funny if I did start choking? Ceramic aluminium chronograph, wristwatch, centralized display. Now, we know Singer being the, the brand that makes their awesome Porsche customized pieces. They're amazing cars. And here we see what they're now doing, a designated movement. Now, as far as I know, this is the same movement that is used in the Moser Streamliner. It is. I'm pretty sure. Let me just double check. I, I'm, I'm very certain. Similar. I don't, I, I don't know the manufacturer, but that's... Yeah, it is. I mean, you see how the pushes are done? Yeah, okay. I've just woken up to this. Can't believe it. I really like this watch. 1950s. It's a real gem. 1970s, sorry. It's a real gem. We've got contrasting colors, typical orange layout. I love the singer name. That cursive script is beautiful. And it's a bullhead, but not really a bullhead. It's kind of an alien. Fun. Call it the Shrek head, more like. Uh, which emoticon for he he Heimlichtel? Oh, what? Uh, Forbin, I have no idea what that is. Where's the half? Are we chatting about Baywatch now? I don't know what is happening. Uh, okay, going to carry on through though. Beautiful piece. Riveted, I don't know, this has a riveted strap, which is strange. Very, very strange. Don't hassle the half. So again, 73 Math is asking a question. Everyone in the chat, I think you should answer this because they're more Rolex aficionados than anyone in the chat at the moment. He's asking about... Should I swap my 114270 for a 16613 black dial? Hmm. So it's a it's a two-tone sub, right? Two-tone sub black dial. If it was me, no, I would hold on to the Explorer. But that's just me. I'm sorry. I, I'm just such a fan of it. I love the Arabics. This singer is a limited edition Hong Kong version. Okay. Picked one up at the second hand store. Okay. So these are only 2019. They came out quite recently. <clears throat> Okay, moving on to 171. I can't believe the show has been going on for so long. Ah, another. You, see, you notice how there is some consistency to the show. Another gold date just. Brown Dow is gorgeous. Yeah, probably go for a lot of money. Rolex, we've said this a couple of times. Make a solid gold date just. Make a solid gold oyster perpetual. Get us happy. 1957. Such beautiful things back in the day. No cyclops, the, the leaf, we call them leaf style hands. No sword hands, alpha hands, God knows. Um, everyone's saying no, 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 never. The Explorer is boring, Neferion. It's a good point. I mean, it's it's not a, it's so difficult to, and there's such different watches. I mean, the best thing of all, just go for both if you can, given the opportunity. Um, and Megan says nice style. It's really cool. I just, I love how clean these pieces were. 1950s, they just hit differently, you know. Oh, I love it. In a way, though, judging by the finish, it looks like leather. It looks like leather that has been polished with, with boot polish. <laughs> Doesn't it look funny? Um, Sam Ray says, love the Explorer. I mean, you, you've got one. You're saving up for one, if I remember right, Sam Ray. Yeah, it's boring. So boring. <laughs> let's, have, let's start a debate about the Explorer. Yeah, I think that... The downside to the watch is the name in many ways. It's just not a watch for exploring anymore. It's it's just a it's just a jazzed up waist perpetual. Uh, got so many stretch marks. Looks like a Daytona. <laughs> I don't get that reference at all, Justin. <laughs> so 1675 uh, dual time. This bezel has seen some aging. Um, this being the what we say the shrunken nipple, not the full areola that we like so much. Still the great looking piece. Not on a bracelet, though. Sad. Pretty sad. This has seen some serious sun bleach in its life. Bring gold black. <laughs> Bring gold black. <laughs> Bring gold back, Megan says. Yeah, I agree there. Getting um, getting a Black Bay 58 next. Okay. Not a bad shot. Just get the standard gilt dial. I think that's pretty good. Also, they're bringing out a Marine National collaboration piece September 1st, thanks to Eric telling me that story. So maybe wait for that because if there's any Black Bay that I'm going to be getting, it's going to be a Tudor that partners with Marine National. Vintage guitars can go tropical too. Yes, they can. They can go spider dial. Uh, when you look at Gibsons and their Les Pauls, they have so many names for them. Jumping next to 1073. Um, how cool is this watch? Yeah, Les Pauls, they have cherry bursts and lemon bursts, and they all came from one, one model. 
No bracelet again. Yep. As, as Megan says, showing wear. This is from 1966, and I chose this because the numerals are fun. Uh, it's so weird. Definitely not for everyone. It looks a bit strange with the shrunken numerals set inside there. Ed Reynolds, 1972, the Coca-Cola Bottling Company. Wow, of California. How cool is that? 25 years of service. That's pretty nice. I like that little bit of history. That makes quite a difference. Still, it's not a watch for everyone. It gives me Railmaster vibes, actually. Railmaster Omega vibes. Champagne dial looks very pretty. Um, Pamela Anderson, yes, for sure. I don't know why we're still talking about Baywatch, but hey, I mean, we really are jumping everywhere. Caramel dials, uh, yeah, pretty nice. 59 Lemon Drop, the Grail. Ooh, there's some good ones. You know, for me, Eric, I am, I'm very cliche, but I would just go for the standard. If I could find a goalie, gold top, done, Dustin. I might even, I know it's blasphemy, but I might even enjoy the P90s. I'm a strat guy, so it makes sense, right? P90s on a gold top, like an original with a floating bridge on that huge, uh, I don't even know what they call those. Okay, let's jump to 1074. We are approaching the four-hour mark, and it's terrible. Shouldn't be. And this is fun. I liked this as a highlight just to appreciate the fuchsia dial that these go over time. They call this a tropical dial. This is a very specific reference in this category that had this age. This also being a nipple dial, which is pretty cool. Just typical of its time, you know. 1680, they had the same reference back then. Solid gold. Uh, watch reference 1002 should own it. Yeah, Megan, talking about that Coca-Cola one. It's nice. This is fun. These are getting harder to find. I believe they're very, very sought after. Still clean. Conditions pretty good. Solid gold Rolex Submariner with a purple fuchsia dial. FNP90. Yeah, Fabric National, for sure. Uh, Karen on grape dial. That's it. Eight minutes left. Hans says, oh, you guys, I got. I think I should speed through these now. I've got how many? Five to go. Okay, let's do it. Let's look at the last five and then uh, call it Finch Crown Guards. Sam Ray is brilliant. Finch Beak. That's so funny. Finch Crown Guards. So good, man. Sam Ray, you're dropping some good lines tonight. Well done. Uh, Purple Fuchsia Dial, sorry, I didn't like it. Can't imagine it would be an easy watch to sell. Apparently, these are really sought out. I don't know why. Uh, the, the blue, How the blue fades to Fuchsia, that's what I want to know, actually. The UV, how that affects it. Um, right, going to carry on now to 1075. We're almost done and dusted. Can you believe? Oh, this is a nice one. 626.3. I've handled the stainless steel model of this. Still on the Jubilee, something you don't see often. 14 carats. I'm guessing that's American market. You don't see it on Jubilee bracelet very often, but it looks good. And I believe that sometimes you would have the watch case being 14 and then the bracelet being like 9 carat or something. I don't know. Weird. Very, very weird. They had this you know, back in the day, the 70s, and everything was all over the place. Still, again, we had a look at a model, I think, very similar. I think it was a 6241 on a leather strap at one stage. I think that contrast on the dial is just so, so good. Look at that stretch. Good points. Got to love a good bracelet stretch. Ugh, down there. Sucks. Can be fixed easily, though. You can tighten it up. Problem with gold is that it, it tends to stretch. Our nipple dial is easier to read when it's cold. Technically, yes, Mark. It does make a big difference. And... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Sam Ray loved it. As opposed to the best SLR ever. We're talking about McLarens now. We're talking about, I think we're talking about guitars. All right, Stretch Armstrong breast. That's it, right? That is it. That is so funny. Okay, jumping the last. Got four more left. Here we go. 1,079. Yeah, let's see, 1,079. Why did I choose this? I think it's just because it, it looks like a longer one, but it's not. It's rare and impressive. Mm-hmm. 31-day power reserve, indication, guarantee, box papers. 31-day, what? S what? How slow is the beat rate on this thing? That is, cr what? So that's a full month's power reserve. How sick is that? 46, 46 mils or not. How cool is that for a size? Oh, that is awesome. That is so, so, so cool. I like that. I really do. Date is in a nice position. They've just nailed that asymmetry. What a win. Okay. So it means to tell me that there's so much torque, you actually need a tool to wind this thing, the back there. That is so funny. Check that mainspring. It's huge. It takes up the full size of the watch. 
Only Lunga. There we go. What the hell kind of... That's such a strange-looking gadget. That's just fun. That's just pure, pure fun. I like this a lot. This is awesome. 31-day power reserve. Who needs a winder when you can just fully crank this thing up? Nuts. Reverse longer one, maybe. Yeah. Get the soldier iron. You have to wind this with a key. I love it. Love it. Um, yeah. So he's chatting still about Matt's, Matt's Explorer. Yeah. I hope you've had some, some feedback there and, and what you're thinking about that whole model. Good size. 46. Show that ALS off. Yeah. Uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis show that off for sure yeah it's really nice i like this i had no idea it was a 31 day power reserve that makes a big big difference watch finder has a video on this piece would recommend i'm not going to read out this reference it might require me to get into an ambulance afterwards so we're jumping to 1083 next reading my little checklist eberhard of course we come to the end eberhard whatever you want to call it so reference 14901, fine and rare. There's lots of these out there, but this one is special. This is like one of the definitive chronos that they made with a proto dial, okay? Also notice has a roulette date. And this watch is worth, worth bidding on. There's lots to take in. Stunning. Really, and just the typeface and everything about it. That bi-compax layout is special. I think we were actually chatting about this on a show at one stage. There's a 50 that's in highlights. I don't know what that means, but all of them have it. I have no idea why. If it was an anniversary piece, um, looks like a big fashion watch. I can see my sister wearing that ALS. That looks gorgeous. To me, at least, it looks gorgeous. It looks huge, though. 40, 40, yeah. Labeled Bakelite bezel. It probably is. Uh, no, no, no. 1965. I'd imagine it's probably aluminum or aluminum. Uh, prefer the black. Uh, 1663, okay. Uh, nothing to write home about. It's very, I think the one downside is it looks very safe as a design. It doesn't have anything too exciting on it. And I mean, the 65s and the 68s, those are the glory days of these chronos. They were just so, so busy. Between 100 and, and 200, they're expecting this to go for. These are really sought after, though. Stunning. Buy compacts, curious. Oh, you guys never. It's awesome. I love it. Uh, 1085, two more. Here we go. You notice how many I'm missing out. There's still a long list, but we're not going to finish with those because it's all Nautiluses and the usual stuff. Aluminum. Aluminum. Yeah, but there's another eye in there, truth fears. <laughs> Bezel is in bad shape. Yep, I agree, Megan. I like this too. Look at that thing. A Medico Compax. Now, look, this is a watch specifically made to determine pulsations. And I, I love it for that reason. 1945, 38 mil diameter, Universal Genève. Can you go wrong with it? Sword hand is also stunning. This was made right at that time. You know, 1945, war was coming to an end. Doctors needed watches to help with pulses. Why not? And and the typical arrangement that we see that's very obvious is the way the subdials are done. Tiny little subdials. Um, stunning. I love the fact that the thing that dominates the dial are the red pulsations. Um, just cleans it up. Really add. Come back universal. Yeah, I think that's what everyone's clamoring for, huh? Someone needs to buy up the brand. Someone really needs to do it. I really like medical watches in my vintage collection. They're cool, right? And do they all, Megan, I'm, I'm not someone who's well averse with them, but do they all have um, pulsation rated segments to them? I'm pretty sure most of them have a pulsation dial just for the sake of that quirk. I'm sure most of you know what pulsation dials are. Uh, yeah, awesome, awesome. Last but not least, 1,109, crossing it off. What is there to look at? Jeepers, I really skipped a few. Oh, why did I choose this? I think I wanted to look at it because it looked like an Aztec calendar in a way. You know, the Mayan calendar 5212 that we chat about often. This has baguettes on it. I didn't even realize. 175th anniversary. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I think that's why I chose it. I just thought, yeah, it looks fun. Um, that's so funny. Megan's saying next. Isn't that that's hilarious? That is so hilarious. I don't know why I chose this. The reason why I've I've skipped through a lot of the stuff in other places was because they kind of meh. I mean, Roger, should we look at some of these crazy things? It's I mean, we're already pushing four hours, I think. <laughs> yeah. There were some very I mean, we've seen a lot of these Pateks before. There were some really safe ones that are very sterile standard pieces. And uh, we've seen this before. This is was quite a popular watch that came out recently. 
nothing too exciting to write home about. Of course, the 5270, everyone would go nuts for. And we end with a Nautilus, as you would expect. I'm pretty sure it's Nautilus. No, it's not. It's a world time. Okay, we can end with this. Platinum world time. Mayans were weird. <laughs> yeah, that, I don't know why I chose that. What was that reference? 1109. Just for shits and giggles. I thought it was pretty funny. Okay, well, that's cool. Let's leave this on just for the sake of it. I love it. We've got bling and yuck and vomiting, and that's how we end these shows. Hospital time. About to hit the four-hour mark. Enamel. Should I stay on the world time? Might as well, I guess. I just I just dig the arrangements. I think that was fun. Also, a pulsation dial, which is something to add, and a tachymeter. And it also has a sub-dial for your telemeter. So weird, man. So, so weird. Watchmaking. Just watchmaking. 5131. Um, five, uh, 5270. Everyone loves it. 5370 is even more rare and attractive. Uh, Koji, thank you. So, you've been here the whole time. Thank you so, so much for, for being a part of the show. <laughs> for everyone who's been able to sit through this for nearly four hours, you're champions. Um, I'm glad you enjoyed it. It was good fun. And it was so nice having a short list to check off. I think I know exactly what to do now in future with these auctions. It makes a big difference. It saves me. So thinking of going through 200 plus lots kills you. At least this time we've looked at about 150, had a pretty good time, still ended up being nearly four hours, but what the hell. Um, Megan mentioning about the strap, another Zeppelin length performance mark. It's so funny. I love that. Um, and Rick, absolute pleasure. Megan said that strap, you don't like it. Yeah, the polish strap. I'm pretty sure Rick has a watch similar to this in this I think he has that that perpetual arrangement. The bracelet is all so highly polished for what it is. But even still, this was good fun. Uh, ladies and gents, going to call it before we hit the four-hour mark. Again, a recommendation to check out the watches of the French Armed Forces video that came out two days ago, I think. It will be in the corner of the screen as a playback eventually if you're watching this on a laptop or an iPad or something, I think. Uh, that one took a year's worth of just piecing together. So would recommend it if you want to learn anything about Breguet Type 20s and the evolution of Blancpain and the evolution of the Tudor Snowflake and all that stuff. It covers a lot of provenance in one place. So let's see if I can do this smoothly, exiting the full screen, stop the screen share. And ladies and gentlemen, I can't believe it's been four hours. I've got a second wind now. <laughs> I think I might go for a run at two in the morning. Um, Thank you all so much for joining in, as always. The show was good fun. I did not expect to have so much energy doing this since we did another one. We did this like a month ago, and it nearly killed me. But who knows? It's, uh, it's always a blast. I see Blue Shirt and Mark. Absolute pleasure, really. I look forward to next Saturday, Blue Shirt. That's all I can say. I can't wait to be able to sit back and listen to a live show, <laughs> not participate, put my feet up, and listen to the banter, as always. Um, yeah, you guys take care of yourselves. Have an excellent Sunday. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. And I hope the weather is improving for all of us. We now have some freedom to actually get around and travel and enjoy sporting events and do all that. So, yeah, have a good time. Take care of yourselves. I'll see you in the next one. Have an excellent end of your weekend. Cheers for now.